Olive, again. By Elizabeth Strout. Arrested. In the early afternoon on a Saturday in June, Jack Kennison put on his sunglasses, got into his sports car with the top down, strapped the seatbelt over his shoulder and across his large stomach, and drove to Portland almost an hour away to buy a gallon of whiskey rather than bump into Olive Kitteridge at the grocery store here in Crosby, Maine. Or even that other woman he had seen twice in the store as he stood holding his whiskey while she talked about the weather. The weather. That woman he could not remember her name was a widow as well. As he drove, an almost calmness came to him, and once in Portland he parked and walked down by the water. Summer had opened itself, and while it was still chilly in mid-June, the sky was blue and the gulls were flying above the docks. There were people on the sidewalks, many were young people with kids or strollers, and they all seemed to be talking to one another. This fact impressed him. How easily they took this for granted, to be with one another, to be talking. No one seemed to even glance at him, and he realized what he had known before, only now it came to him differently, he was just an old man with a sloppy belly and not anyone worth noticing. Almost, this was freeing. There had been many years of his life when he was a tall, good-looking man, no gut, strolling about the campus at Harvard, and people did look at him then, for all those years, he would see students glance at him with deference, and also women, they looked at him. At department meetings he had been intimidating, this was told to him by colleagues, and he understood it to be true, for he had meant to be that way. Now he sauntered down one of the wharfs where condos were built, and he thought perhaps he should move here, water everywhere around him, and people too. He took from his pocket his cell phone, glanced at it, and returned it to his pocket. It was his daughter he wished to speak to. A couple emerged from the door of one apartment, they were his age, the man also had a stomach, though not as big as Jack's, and the woman looked worried, but the way they were together made him think they had been married for years. It's over now, he heard the woman say, and the man said something, and the woman said, no, it's over. They walked past him, not noticing him, and when he turned to glance at them a moment later, he was surprised vaguely to see that the woman had put her arm through the man's, as they walked down the wharf toward the small city. Jack stood at the end of the wharf and watched the ocean, he looked one way, then the other. Small whitecaps rolled up from a breeze that he felt only now. This is where the ferry came in from Nova Scotia, he and Betsy had taken it one day. They had stayed in Nova Scotia three nights. He tried to think if Betsy had put her arm through his, she may have. So now his mind carried an image of them walking off the ferry, his wife's arm through his. He turned to go. Knucklehead. He said the word out loud and saw a young boy on the wharf close by turn to look at him, startled. This meant he was an old man who was talking to himself on a wharf in Portland, Maine, and he could not Jack Kennison, with his two PhDs he could not figure out how this had happened. Wow. He said that out loud as well, past the young boy by now. There were benches, and he sat down on an empty one. He took out his phone and called his daughter, it would not yet be noontime in San Francisco, where she lived. He was surprised when she answered. Dad, she said. Are you okay? He looked skyward. Oh, Cassie, he said, I just wondered how you were doing. I'm okay, Dad. Okay, then. Good. That's good to hear. There was silence for a moment, then she said, where are you? Oh. I'm on the dock in Portland. Why? she asked. I just thought I'd come to Portland. You know, get out of the house. Jack squinted out toward the water. Another silence. Then she said, okay. Listen, Cassie, Jack said, I just wanted to say I know I'm a shit. I know that. Just so you know. I know that I'm a shit. Daddy, she said. Daddy, come on. What am I supposed to say? Nothing, he answered agreeably. Nothing to say to that. But I just wanted you to know I know. 
There was another silence, longer this time, and he felt fear. She said, is this because of how you've treated me, or because of your affair for all those years with Elaine Croft? He looked down at the planks of the wharf, saw his black old man sneakers on the roughened boards. Both, he said. Or you can take your pick. Oh, daddy, she said. Oh, daddy, I don't know what to do. What am I supposed to do for you? He shook his head. Nothing, kid. You're not supposed to do anything for me. I just wanted to hear your voice. Dad, we were on our way out. Yeah? Where are you going? The farmer's market. It's Saturday and we go to the farmer's market on Saturdays. Okay, Jack said. You get going. Don't worry. I'll talk to you again. Bye bye now. He thought he could hear her sigh. All right, she said. Goodbye. And that was that. That was that. Jack sat on the bench a long time. People walked by, or perhaps no people walked by for a while, but he kept thinking of his wife, Betsy, and he wanted to howl. He understood only this, that he deserved all of it. He deserved the fact that right now he wore a pad in his underwear because of prostate surgery, he deserved it, he deserved his daughter not wanting to speak to him because for years he had not wanted to speak to her she was gay, she was a gay woman, and this still made a small wave of uneasiness move through him. Betsy, though, did not deserve to be dead. He deserved to be dead, but Betsy did not deserve that status. And yet he felt a sudden fury at his wife oh, Jesus Christ Almighty, he muttered. When his wife was dying, she was the one who was furious. She said, I hate you. And he said, I don't blame you. She said, oh, stop it. But he had meant it how could he blame her? He could not blame her. And the last thing she said to him was, I hate you because I'm going to die and you're going to live. As he glanced up at a seagull, he thought, but I'm not living, Betsy. What a terrible joke it has been. The bar at the Regency Hotel was in the basement, the walls were dark green and the windows looked out at the sidewalks, but the sidewalks were high up in the windows, and mostly he could just see legs going by. He sat at the bar and ordered one whiskey neat. The bartender was a pleasant fellow. Good, Jack said when the young man asked how he was today. Okay, then, said the bartender, his eyes were small and dark beneath his longish dark hair. As he poured the drink, Jack noticed that he was older than he had first seemed, although Jack had a hard time these days figuring out the age of people, the young especially. And then Jack thought, what if I'd had a son? He had thought this so many times in his life it surprised him that he kept wondering. And what if he had not married Betsy on the rebound, as he had? He had been on the rebound, and she had been as well, from that fellow Tom Grogger she'd loved so much in college. What then? Troubled but feeling better he was in the presence of someone, the bartender Jack laid these thoughts out before him like a large piece of cloth. He understood that he was a 74-year-old man who looks back at life and marvels that it unfolded as it did, who feels unbearable regret for all the mistakes made. And then he thought, how does one live an honest life? This was not the first time he had wondered this, but it felt different today, he felt distant from it, and he truly wondered. So what brings you to Portland? The bartender asked this as he wiped the bar with a cloth. Jack said, nothing. The fellow glanced up at him, turning slightly to wipe the other part of the counter. I wanted to get out of the house, Jack said. I live in Crosby. Nice town, Crosby. Yes, it is. Jack sipped his whiskey, put the glass down with care. My wife died seven months ago, he said. Now the fellow looked at Jack again pushing his hair out of his eyes. Sorry? Did you say? I said my wife died seven months ago. That's too bad, the fellow said. That's gotta be tough. Well, it is. Yes, it is. 
The young man's face didn't change expression as he said, my dad died a year ago and my mom's been great, but I know it's been hard on her. Sure. Jack hesitated, then he said, how's it been on you? Oh, it's sad. But he was sick a while. You know. Jack felt the inner slow burn that was familiar to him, which he felt when that widow talked about the weather in the grocery store. He wanted to say, stop it. Tell me how it's really been. He sat back, pushed his glass forward. It's just the way it was, that's all. People either didn't know how they felt about something or they chose never to say how they really felt about something. And this is why he missed Olive Kitteridge. Okay, he said to himself. Okay now. Easy, boy. With deliberation, he made his mind return to Betsy. And then he remembered something how curious that he should remember this now, when he had gone in for surgery many years back, to have his gallbladder out, his wife had stood at his side in recovery, and when he woke again later a patient near him said, your wife was gazing at you with such love, I was struck at how she was looking at you so lovingly. Jack had believed this, it had, he remembered, made him a tiny bit uneasy, and then years later during an argument he brought it up and Betsy said, I was hoping you would die. Her directness had flabbergasted him. You were hoping I would die. In his memory he had opened his arms in astonishment as he asked her this. And then she had said, looking uncomfortable, it would have made things easier for me. So there was that. Oh, Betsy. Betsy, 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 we blew it we blew our chance. He could not really pinpoint when, maybe because there had never been a chance. After all, she was she, and he was he. On their wedding night she had given herself, but not freely, as she had in the months before. He did, of course, always remember that. And she had never really given herself freely since that night, now four to three years ago. How long have you lived in Crosby? The bartender asked him this. Six years. Jack switched his legs to the other side of the barstool. I have now lived in Crosby, Maine for six years. The bartender nodded. A couple came in and sat down at the far end of the bar, they were young, and the woman had long hair that she smoothed over one shoulder a confident person. The bartender walked over to them. Now Jack allowed his mind to go to Olive Kitteridge. Tall, big, God, she was a strange woman. He had liked her quite a bit, she had an honesty was it an honesty? She had something about her. A widow, she had it felt to him practically saved his life. They'd gone to dinner a few times, a concert, he had kissed her on the mouth. He could laugh out loud to think about this now. Her mouth. Olive Kitteridge. Like kissing a barnacle-covered whale. She had a grandson born a couple of years ago, Jack hadn't especially cared, but she had cared because the kid was called Henry after his grandfather, Olive's dead husband. Jack had suggested she go see the little fellow Henry in New York City and she had said, well, she didn't think so. Who knows why? Things were not good with her son, he knew that much. But things weren't good with his daughter either. They had that in common. He remembered how Olive had told him right away that her father had killed himself when she was thirty. Shot himself in his kitchen. Maybe this had something to do with how she was it must have. And then she had come over one morning and unexpectedly lain down next to him on the bed in the guest room. Boy, he had been relieved. Relief had just flowed through him when she put her head on his chest. Stay, he said finally, but she rose and said she had to get home. I'd like it if you stayed, he said, but she did not. And she never returned. When he tried calling her, she did not answer the telephone. He had bumped into her in the grocery store only once a few days after she had lain down with him, he'd been holding his jug of whiskey. Olive, he'd exclaimed. But she had been agitated, her son, down in New York City, was going to have another baby any day. I thought he just had a baby, Jack said, and she said, well, the woman was pregnant again and they hadn't even told her until now. 
Olive had a grandson, why did they need more kids, there were already two the wife had brought into the marriage. Olive must have said that three times at least. He called her the next day, and the telephone just kept ringing, and he realized she didn't have her answering machine turned on. Could that be true? Anything could be true with Olive. He assumed she had probably, finally, gone to New York to see this new grandchild, because when he called again the next day, there was no answer then either. He emailed her with the subject line? And then no subject. She had not answered that either. More than three weeks ago that had been. The bartender was back in front of Jack, making the couple's drinks. Jack said, and you? Did you grow up around here? Nah, the fellow said, I grew up right outside of Boston. I'm here cause of my girlfriend. She lives here. He tossed his head a bit, getting his dark hair out of his eyes. Jack nodded, drank his whiskey. For years my wife and I lived in Cambridge, Jack said, and then we came up here. He could have sworn he saw something on the bartender's face, a smirk, before the fellow turned away and went to place the drinks before the couple. When the fellow returned, he said to Jack, a Harvard man? So you were a Harvard man. He pulled a rack of clean glasses from below him, and began to put them hanging them upside down in the rack above him. I clean toilets there, Jack said. And the idiot guy looked at him quickly, as though to see if he was joking. No, I did not clean toilets. I taught there. Great. You wanted to retire up here? Jack had never wanted to retire. How much do I owe you? he asked. Driving back, he thought of Schroeder, what a goddamnest that man was, what a shit of a dean. When Elaine filed the lawsuit, when she actually did that, citing sexual harassment as the reason she did not get tenure, Schroeder became a terrible man. He was outlandish, would not even let Jack speak to him. It's in the hands of the lawyers, he said. And Jack was put on research leave. Three years it took for that thing to settle, for Elaine to get her significant chunk of change, and by that time Jack and Betsy had moved to Maine, Jack had retired. They came to Maine because Betsy wanted to she wanted to get far away, and boy they did. Crosby was a pretty coastal town she had researched online, and it was about as far away as a person could get, even though it was just a few hours up the east coast. They moved to the town without knowing one person there. But Betsy made friends, it was her nature to do so. Pull over. Pull your car over. These words were said a few times before Jack paid attention to them, they were said through a bullhorn loudspeaker, and the different sound of them, different from just the tires rumbling over the pavement, puzzled Jack, and then he was amazed when he saw the lights flashing blue and the police car right on his tail. Pull your car over. Jesus, Jack said aloud, and he pulled his car over to the side of the highway. He turned the engine off and glanced down to the floor of the passenger seat at the plastic bag that had his whiskey in it, bought at a grocery store outside of Portland. He watched the young policeman who was walking over what a puffed up piece of crap the guy was, wearing his sunglasses and Jack said, politely, how may I help you? Sir, your driver's license and registration. Jack opened the glove compartment, finally found the registration, then pulled his license from his wallet and handed them to the policeman. Were you aware that you were going 70 in a 55-mile zone? The policeman asked him this rudely, Jack felt. Well, no, sir, I was not aware of that. And I'm very sorry. Sarcasm was his weak point, Betsy had always said, but this policeman was beyond hearing that. Were you aware that your car is uninspected? No. It was due for inspection in March. Ha! Huh. Jack looked around the front seat. Well. Here's what happened. Now that I think of it. My wife died, you see. She died. Jack peered up at the police officer. Dead. Jack said this pointedly. Take your sunglasses off, sir. Excuse me. I said, take your sunglasses off, sir. 
Now. Jack removed his sunglasses and smiled in an exaggerated way at the policeman. Now you take yours off, Jack said. Show me yours, and I'll show you mine. He grinned up at the fellow. After holding up Jack's license and then looking at Jack, the policeman said, wait here while I run these. And the policeman went back to his car, which still had the flashing blue lights zinging around. He spoke into his radio as he walked. Within moments another police car came driving up, also with blue lights flashing. You called for backup? Jack yelled this after him. Am I that dangerous? The second policeman got out of his car and walked up to Jack. This man was huge, and not young. He'd seen stuff, is what his walk said, what his eyes expressionless, no sunglasses for him said. What's that in the bag on the floor, the huge man asked with his big voice. It's liquor. Whiskey. Would you like to see? Step out of the car. Jack peered up at him. What? The huge man stepped back. Step out of the car now. Jack got out of the car slowly, because he felt winded. The huge man said, put your hands on the top of the car, and this made Jack laugh. He said, there is no top. See? This is called a convertible and there is no top to the car at the moment. The policeman said, put your hands on the top of the car now. Like this. Jack put his hands on the window frame. Stay there. The man walked back to the car that had pulled Jack over and spoke to the other police officer, sitting in the front seat. It came to Jack then how these days everything was videotaped from a policeman's car he had read this somewhere and he suddenly gave the finger to the two cars behind him. Then he put his hand back on the window frame. Horseshit, he said. Now the first policeman got out of his car and strode up to Jack, his holster strapped against his thigh. Jack, with his big belly hanging out and his hands ridiculously placed on the window frame, looked over at the guy and said, Hey, you're packed. What did you say? The policeman was pissed. I said nothing. You want to be placed under arrest, the policeman asked. Would you like that? Jack started to laugh, then bit his lip. He shook his head, looking down at the ground. And what he saw were many ants. They had been interrupted by his car tracks, and he stared down at the tiny little ants who were making their way through a crack in the pavement, piece of sand by piece of sand from the place where his tire had crushed so many of them, to where? A new spot. Turn around and put your hands up, the policeman directed, and so Jack, holding his hands up, turned around, and he was aware of the cars going by on the turnpike. What if someone recognized him? There was Jack Kennison holding his hands up like a criminal with two police cars and their flashing blue lights. You listen to me, the policeman said. He raised his sunglasses to rub one eye, and in that brief moment Jack saw the man's eyes, and they were strange, like the eyes of a fish. The policeman pointed a finger at Jack. He kept pointing the finger but not saying anything, as though he couldn't remember what he'd been going to say. Jack cocked his head. Listening, he said. All ears. He said this with as much sarcasm as he could. Fish eyes walked around to the other side of Jack's car, opened the door, and brought out the bottle of whiskey in its plastic bag. What's this? he asked, walking back toward Jack. Jack put his arms down and said, I told your friend, it's whiskey. Come on, you can see that. For the love of Christ. Fisheye stepped close to Jack then, and Jack backed away, except there was nowhere to go, his car was right there. Now you tell me again what you just said, Fisheye's directed. I said it's whiskey, and you can see that. And then I said something about Christ. Something about Christ and love. You've been drinking, Fisheye said. You have been drinking, sir. And his voice held something so ugly that Jack was sobered. Fisheye's dropped the bag with the whiskey onto the driver's seat of Jack's car. I have, Jack said. 
I had a drink at the Regency Bar in Portland. From his back pocket Fisheyes brought something forward, it was small enough to be held in one hand, yet square looking and grey, and Jack said, Jesus, are you going to taser me? Fisheyes smiled, he smiled. He stepped toward Jack holding out the thing, and Jack said, please, come on. He held his arms against his chest, he was really frightened. Breathe in this, said Fisheyes, and a little hose appeared from the thing he was holding. Jack put his mouth on the little hose and breathed. Again, said Fisheyes, moving closer to Jack. Jack took another breath, then took his mouth off the hose. Fisheyes looked at the thing closely and said, well, well, you are just under the legal limit. He put the hose gadget back into his pocket and said to Jack, he's writing you up a ticket, and after he gives it to you, I suggest you get in your car and drive straight to a place that gets this car inspected, do you understand me, sir? Jack said, yes. Then he said, may I get back in my car now? Fisheyes leaned toward him. Yes, you can get back in your car now. So Jack sat himself in the driver's seat, which was low to the ground since it was a sports car, and put the whiskey onto the seat next to him, and waited for the huge man to bring him a ticket, but Fisheyes stood right there as though Jack might bolt. And then from the corner of his eye Jack saw something he would never be sure about and would never forget. The policeman's crotch was right at Jack's eye level, and Jack thought he thought but looked away quickly that the guy might be getting a boner. There was a bulge there bigger than Jack glanced up at the man's face, and the guy was staring down at Jack with his sunglasses on. The huge man came over and gave Jack the ticket, and Jack said, thank you very much, fellows. I'll be off now. And he drove slowly away. But Fisheyes followed him all the way down the turnpike until Jack came to the exit for Crosby, and when Jack took the exit the guy did not follow him but headed on straight up the turnpike. Jack let out a yell, get yourself some tighty whities like every other man in this state. Jack took a deep breath and said, okay. It's okay. It's over. He drove the eight miles into Crosby, and on the way he said, Betsy. Betsy. Wait until I tell you what happened to me. You're not going to believe this one, Bets. He allowed himself this, the conversation with her about what had just happened to him. Thanks, Betsy, he said, and what he meant was thanks for being so nice about the prostate surgery. Which she had been, there was no doubt about that. All his life Jack had been an undershorts man. Never for him those tighty whities but in Crosby, Maine, you couldn't buy any undershorts. This had amazed him. And Betsy had gone to Freeport for him, and bought his undershorts there. Then his prostate surgery, almost one year ago, forced him to give up the undershorts. He needed a place to put the stupid pad. How he hated it. And right now, as though on cue, he felt a squirt not a dribble come from him. Oh, for Christ's sake he said out loud. The whole state, it seemed, wore tighty whities just recently Jack had gone to the Walmart on the outskirts of town to buy one more package of them, and he had noticed there were no undershorts there either. Just a slab of tighty whities sized all the way to XXX large for all those poor fat men, huge men, in this state. But Betsy had gone to Freeport and found him undershorts there. Oh, Betsy. Betsy. Home, Jack had trouble believing what had happened during the day, it all seemed ridiculous and somehow almost incidental. He sat for a long time in his big chair, looking at the living room, it was a spacious room with a low blue couch on metal legs that stretched along a few feet from the wall facing the television, then went at a right angle along the other area of the room, with a metal-legged glass coffee table in front. Then Jack turned in his chair and stared through the windows at the field of grass and the trees beyond their leaves bright green. He and Betsy had agreed that they liked the view of this field more than any view of the water, and as he remembered this a warmth trembled through him. Finally he rose, poured himself some whiskey, and boiled four hot dogs on the stove. He kept shaking his head while he opened a can of baked beans. Betsy, he said out loud a few times. 
When he was through eating and had rinsed the dishes he did not put them in the dishwasher, that seemed too much trouble he had one more glass of whiskey and got to thinking of Betsy being so in love with that Tom Grogger fellow. Oh, what a strange thing a life was. But filled with a sense of goodwill the day was almost over and the whiskey was working Jack sat at his computer and googled the fellow, Tom Grogger. He found the man, he was apparently still teaching at that private high school for girls in Connecticut, he'd be eight years younger than Jack. But only girls. Still. Jack scrolled through and saw they'd been accepting young men for about ten years. Then he found a small picture of Tom Grogger, he had grey hair now, he was thin. You could see that in his face, which seemed pleasant enough, and very bland to Jack's eyes. There was an email address for him attached to the school's site. So Jack wrote to him. My wife, Betsy, Arrow as you would have known her, died seven months ago, and I know she loved you very much in her youth. I thought you might want to know about her death. He pressed send. Jack sat back and looked at the light that was changing on the trees. These long, long evenings, they were so long and beautiful, it just killed him. The field was darkening, the trees behind it were like pieces of black canvas, but the sky still sent down the sun, which sliced gently across the grass on the far end of the field. His mind went back over the day and it seemed he could make no sense of it. Had that guy really had a boner? It seemed impossible, yet Jack knew in a way, he knew the feeling of anger and power that might have produced it if the guy had even been getting one. And then Jack thought of the ants that were still going about trying to get their sand wherever they needed it to go. They seemed almost heartbreaking to him, in their tininess and their resilience. Two hours later, Jack checked his email, hoping his daughter might have written and hoping as well that Olive Kitteridge might have reappeared in his life. After all, she had been the one who emailed him the first time, about her son, and he had answered about his daughter. He had even told Olive one day about his affair with Elaine Croft, and Olive had not seemed to judge him. She had spoken of a schoolteacher that she herself had fallen in love with years ago an almost affair, she called it and the man had died in a car accident one night. Now as he checked his email he saw that he had forgotten, forgotten, about Tom Grogger, but there was a reply from tgrogger at whitesjewel.edu. Jack squinted through his reading glasses. I know about the death of your wife. Betsy and I were in contact for many years. I don't know if I should tell you this, or not, but she spoke to me of your own dalliance, and perhaps I should tell you I don't know, as I said, if I should tell you or not but there was a period of time when Betsy and I met in a hotel in Boston, and also New York. Perhaps you already know that. Jack pushed back his chair from the desk the wheels rumbled against the hardwood floor. He pulled the chair back in and read the message again. Betsy, he murmured, why, you son of a gun. He took his glasses off, wiped his arm across his face. Holy shit, he said. In a few minutes he put his glasses back on and read the email one more time. Dalliance, said Jack out loud. Who uses the word dalliance? What are you, Grogger? some faggot. He pushed delete and the message disappeared. Jack felt as sober as a church mouse. He walked around his house, looking at the touches from his wife, the lamps that had that frill around the bottoms, the mahogany bowl she picked up somewhere that stayed on the glass coffee table and was now filled with junk, keys, an old phone that didn't work, business cards, paper clips. He tried to think when his wife went to New York and it was he thought not too far into their marriage. She had been a kindergarten teacher, and he remembered her speaking of meetings in New York she had to attend. He had paid no attention, he was busy getting tenure, and then he was just busy. Jack sat down in his armchair and immediately stood up. He walked around the house again, stared out at the now darkened field, then went upstairs and walked around that too. His bed, their marriage. Bed, was unmade, as it was every day except when the cleaning woman came, and it seemed to him to be the mess that he was, or that they had been. Betsy, he said out loud, Jesus Christ, Betsy. He sat tentatively on the edge of the bed, his hand running up and down his neck. 
Maybe Grogo was just yanking his chain, being mean for the fun of it. But no. Grogo was not the sort, he was, Jack had always gathered, a serious man, he taught English, for the love of Christ, all those years at that school for little twats. Wait, was this why Betsy had said it would have made things easier if Jack had died during his gallbladder operation? That far back. How far back was that? Ten years into their marriage at least. You were doing my wife. Jack said aloud. You little prick. He stood up and resumed his walking through the upstairs. There was another bedroom, and then the room his wife had used as her study, Jack went into them both, turning around as though looking for something. Then he went back downstairs and walked through the two guest rooms, the one with the double bed and the one with the single bed. In the kitchen he poured himself another whiskey from the jug he had bought that day. It seemed days ago he had bought it. His own affair with Elaine Croft had not started until he'd been married for twenty-five years. The urgency he and Elaine had felt, God, it was something. It was terrible. Had Betsy felt that? Not possible, Betsy was not an urgent woman. But how did he know what kind of woman she was? Hey, Cassie, Jack said, your mother was a slut. But he knew, even as he said this, that it was not true. Cassie's mother had been well, she was kind of a slut, for Christ's sake, if she was off doing Grogger in a hotel in Boston and in New York and Cassie was just a little kid, but Betsy had been a wonderful mother, that was the truth. Jack shook his head. Now he suddenly felt drunk. He also knew he would never, ever tell Cassie, he would let her have her mother as she had been, a saint who put up with a homophobic father, a self-absorbed asshole. Okay said Jack. Okay. He sat back at his computer. He retrieved the message from Trash, read it one more time, then wrote being very careful of spelling so it would not sound drunk hello, Tom. Yes, I do know of your meetings with her. This is why I thought you would want to know of her death. He sent it, then he shut the computer off. He stood up and went and sat in his armchair for a long time. He thought once again of the ants he had seen today while that awful fish-eyes man had him against the car, those ants. Just doing what they were meant to do, live until they died, so indiscriminately by Jack's car. He really could not stop thinking of them. Jack Kennison, who had studied human behavior from the medieval times, then the Austro-Hungarian times of Archduke Franz Ferdinand being killed and everyone in Europe blowing each other up as a result Jack was thinking about those ants. Then he thought how tomorrow was Sunday and how long a day that would be. And then he thought as though a kaleidoscope of colours swam past him about his own life, as it had been and as it was now, and he said out loud, you're not much, Jack Kennison. This surprised him, but he felt it to be true. Who had just said that, about not being much? Olive Kitteridge. She had said it regarding some woman in town. She's not much, Olive had said and there was the woman, gone, dismissed. Eventually Jack got out a piece of paper and wrote in pen, Dear Olive Kitteridge, I have missed you, and if you would see fit to call me or email me or see me, I would like that very much. He signed it and stuck it into an envelope. He didn't lick it closed. He would decide in the morning whether to mail it or not. Labor Two days earlier, Olive Kitteridge had delivered a baby. She had delivered the baby in the back seat of her car, her car had been parked on the front lawn of Marlene Borney's house. Marlene was having a baby shower for her daughter, and Olive had not wanted to park behind the other cars lined up on the dirt road. She had been afraid that someone might park behind her and she wouldn't be able to get out, Olive liked to get out. So she had parked her car on the front lawn of the house, and a good thing she had, that foolish girl her name was Ashley and she had bright blonde hair she was a friend of Marlene's daughter had gone into labor, and Olive knew it before anyone else did, they were all sitting around the living room on folding chairs and she had seen Ashley, who sat next to her, and who was enormously pregnant, wearing a red stretch top to accentuate this pregnancy, leave the room, and Olive just knew. She'd gotten up and found the girl in the kitchen, leaning over the sink, saying, oh god, oh god, 
and Olive had said to her, you're in labor, and the idiot child had said, I think I am. But I'm not due for another week. Stupid child. And a stupid baby shower. Olive, thinking of this as she sat in her own living room, looking out over the water, could not, even now, believe what a stupid baby shower that had been. She said out loud, stupid, 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 stupid. And then she got up and went into her kitchen and sat down there. God, she said. She rocked her foot up and down. The big wristwatch of her dead husband, Henry, which she wore, and had worn since his stroke four years ago, said it was four o'clock. All right then, she said. And she got her jacket it was June, but not warm today and her big black handbag and she went and got into her car which had that gunky stuff still left on the back seat from that foolish girl, although Olive had tried to clean it as best she could and she drove to Libby's, where she bought a lobster roll, and then she drove down to the point and sat in her car there and ate the lobster roll, looking out at Halfway Rock. A man in a pickup truck was parked nearby, and Olive waved through her window to him but he did not wave back. Fooey to you, she said, and a small piece of lobster meat landed on her jacket. Oh, hell's bells, she said, because the mayonnaise had gotten into the jacket she could see a tiny dark spot and would spoil the jacket if she didn't get it to hot water fast. The jacket was new, she had made it yesterday, sewing the pieces of quilted blue and white swirling fabric on her old machine being sure to make it long enough to go over her hind end. Agitation ripped through her. The man in the pickup truck was talking on a cell phone, and he suddenly laughed, she could see him throwing his head back, could even see his teeth as he opened his mouth in his laughter. Then he started his truck and backed it up, still talking on his cell phone, and Olive was alone with the bay spread out before her, the sunlight glinting over the water the trees on the small island standing at attention, the rocks were wet, the tide was going out. She heard the small sounds of her chewing, and a loneliness that was profound assailed her. It was Jack Kennison. She knew this is what she had been thinking of, that horrible old rich flubdub of a man she had seen for a number of weeks this spring. She had liked him. She had even lain down on his bed with him one day, a month ago now, right next to him, could hear his heart beating as her head lay upon his chest. And she had felt such a rush of relief and then fear had rumbled through her. Olive did not like fear. And so after a while she had sat up and he had said, stay, Olive. But she did not stay. Call me, he had said. I would like it if you called me. She had not called. He could call her if he wanted to. And he had not called. But she had bumped into him soon after, in the grocery store, and told him about her son who was going to have another baby any day down in New York City, and Jack had been nice about that, but he had not suggested she come see him again, and then she saw him later, he had not seen her, in the same store, talking to that stupid widow Bertha Babcock, who for all Olive knew was a Republican like Jack was, and maybe he preferred that stupid woman to Olive. Who knew? He had sent one email with a bunch of question marks in the subject line and nothing more. That was an email. Olive didn't think so. Fooey to you, she said now, and finished her lobster roll. She rolled up the paper it had come in and tossed it onto the back seat, where that mess still showed in a stain from that idiot girl. I delivered a baby today, she had told her son on the telephone. Silence. Did you hear me? Olive asked. I said I delivered a baby today. Where? His voice sounded wary. In my car outside Marlene Borney's house. There was a girl and she told him the story. Ha! Huh. Well done, Mom. Then in a sardonic tone he said, you can come here and deliver your next grandchild. And having it in a pool. A pool? Olive could not understand what he was saying. Christopher spoke in a muffled tone to someone near him. And pregnant again. Christopher, why didn't you tell me? She's not pregnant yet. We're trying. But she'll get pregnant. Olive said, what do you mean, she's having it in a pool? A swimming pool? Yeah. 
sort of. A kiddie pool. The kind we had in the backyard. Only this one is bigger and obviously super clean. Why? Why? Because it's more natural. The baby slides into the water. The midwife will be here. It's safe. It's better than safe, it's the way babies should be born. I see, said Olive. She didn't see at all. When is she having this baby? As soon as we know she's pregnant, we'll start counting. We're not telling anyone that we're even trying, because of what just happened to the last one. But I just told you. So there. All right then, Olive said. Goodbye. Christopher she was sure of this had made a sound of disgust before he said, Goodbye, Mom. Back home, Olive was pleased to see that the little spot of mayonnaise on her new jacket responded to the hot water and soap, and she hung it in the bathroom to let the spot dry. Then she went back and sat in the chair overlooking the bay. The sun slanted at an angle across it, nothing but sparkles at the moment, only a lobster boy or two could be seen, the sun at this time of day was that bright as it cut right across the water. She could not stop thinking how stupid that baby shower had been. All women. Why only women at a baby shower? Did men have nothing to do with this business of babies? Olive thought she didn't like women. She liked men. She had always liked men. She had wanted five sons. And she still wished she had had them, because Christopher was oh, Olive felt the weight of real sadness descend now, as it had been on her ever since Henry had his stroke, four years ago, and as it had been since his death, two years ago now, she could almost feel her chest becoming heavy with it. Christopher and Anne had called their first baby together Henry, after Chris's father. Henry Kitteridge. What a wonderful name. A wonderful man. Olive had not met her grandson. She shifted in her chair, putting her hand to her chin, and thought again about that baby shower. There had been a table with food, Olive had been able to see intermittently, from where she had sat, little sandwiches and deviled eggs and tiny pieces of cake. When Marlene's pregnant daughter went by, Olive had tugged on her smock and said, would you bring me some of that food? The girl looked surprised and then said, oh, of course, Mrs. Kitteridge. But the girl was waylaid by her guests, and it took forever before Olive had on her lap a small paper plate with two deviled eggs and a piece of chocolate cake. No fork, no napkin, nothing. Thank you, Olive had said. She stuck the piece of cake into her mouth in one bite, then tucked the plate with the deviled eggs far beneath her chair. Deviled eggs made her gag. Marlene's daughter sat down in a white wicker chair that had ribbons attached to the top, flowing down, like she was queen for a day. When everybody finally took a seat no one took the seat next to Olive until that pregnant girl Ashley had to because there were no other seats left when they were all seated, Olive saw the table piled high with presents, and it was then she realized, she had not brought a gift. A wave of horror passed through her. Marlene Borney, on her way to the front of the room, stopped and said quietly, Olive, how is Christopher? Olive said, his new baby died. Heartbeat stopped a few days before it was due. And had to push it out dead. Olive. Marlene's pretty eyes filled with tears. No reason to cry about it, Olive said. Olive had cried. She had cried like a newborn baby when she hung up the phone from Christopher after he told her. Oh, Olive, I'm so sorry to hear that. Marlene turned her head, looking over the room in a glance, then said quietly, best not to tell anyone here, don't you think? Fine, Olive said. Marlene squeezed Olive's hand and said, let me tend to these girls. Marlene stepped into the center of the room, clapping her hands, and said, okay, shall we get started? Marlene picked up a gift from the table and handed it to her daughter, who read the card and said, Oh, this is from Ashley, and everyone turned to look at the blonde pregnant girl next to Olive. Ashley gave a little wave, her face glowing. Marlene's daughter unwrapped the gift, she took the ribbons and stuck them onto a paper plate with scotch tape. 
Then she finally produced a little box, and in the box was a tiny sweater. Oh, look at this, she said. From the room came many sounds of appreciation. And then, to Olive's dismay, the sweater was passed from person to person. When it reached her she said very nice and handed it to Ashley, who said, I've already seen it, and people laughed, and Ashley handed it to the person on the other side of her, who said many things about the sweater, then turned to give it to the girl on her left. This all took a long time. One girl said, you knit this yourself. And Ashley said she had. Someone else said that her mother-in-law knit too, but nothing as nice as this sweater. Ashley seemed to stiffen and her eyes got big. Oh, that's nice, she said. Finally it was time for the next gift, and Marlene walked one over to her daughter. The daughter looked at the card and said, from Marie. A young woman waved a hand at everyone from the far end of the room. Marlene's daughter took her time attaching the ribbons from the gift onto the paper plate with tape, and then Olive understood that this would happen with each gift and in the end there would be a plate of ribbons. This confused Olive. She sat and waited, and then Marlene's daughter held up a set of plastic baby bottles with little leaves painted on them. This did not go over as well, Olive noticed. Won't you be breastfeeding, someone asked, and Marlene's daughter said, well, I'll try and then she said, gaily, but I'm sure these will come in handy. Marie said, I just thought, you never know. So it's best to have some bottles around even if you breastfeed. Of course, someone said, and the bottles were passed around too. Olive thought they would go around faster, but it seemed that every person who touched the bottles had a story to tell about breastfeeding. Olive had certainly not breastfed Christopher back then, no one did, except people who thought they were superior. A third gift was presented to Marlene's daughter, and Olive distinctly felt distress. She could not imagine how long it would take this child to unwrap every goddamned gift on that table and put the ribbons so carefully on the goddamned paper plate, and then everyone had to wait wait while every gift was passed around. She thought she had never heard of such foolishness in her life. Into her hands was placed a yellow pair of booties, she stared at them, then handed them to Ashley, who said, these are gorgeous. And then Olive suddenly thought how she had not been happy even before Henry had his stroke. Why this clarity came to her at that point she did not know. Her knowledge of this unhappiness came to her at times, but usually when she was alone. The truth is that Olive did not understand why age had brought with it a kind of hard-heartedness toward her husband. But it was something she had seemed unable to help, as though the stone wall that had rambled along between them during the course of their long marriage a stone wall that separated them but also provided unexpected dips of moss-covered warm spots where sunshine would flicker between them in a sudden laugh of understanding had become tall and unyielding, and not providing flowers in its crannies but some ice storm frozen along it instead. In other words, something had come between them that seemed insurmountable. She could, on certain days, point out to herself the addition of a boulder here, a pile of rocks there, Christopher's adolescence, her feelings for that Jim O'Casey fellow so long ago who had taught school with her, Henry's ludicrous behavior with that Thibodeau girl, the horror of a crime she and Henry had endured together when, under the threat of death, unspeakable things were spoken, and there had been Christopher's divorce, and his leaving town, but she still did not understand why they should walk into old age with this high and horrible wall between them and it was her fault. Because as her heart became more constricted, Henry's heart became media, and when he walked up behind her in the house sometimes to slip his arms around her, it was all she could do to not visibly shudder. Stop, she wanted to shout. But why? What crime had he been committing, except to ask for her love? It's a breast pump, Ashley said to her. Because Olive was holding a plastic contraption, turning it over, unable to figure out what it was. Okay, Olive said, and she handed it to Ashley. Olive looked at the table of gifts and thought that not even a dent had been made in them. A pale green baby's blanket came around. Olive liked the feel of it, she kept it on her lap, smoothing her hands over it. Someone said, Mrs. Kitteridge, let's share, and Olive handed it to Ashley immediately. 
Ashley said, ooh, this is nice, and that's when Olive saw that Ashley had drops of sweat running down the side of her face. And then Olive thought she was quite sure she heard the girl whisper, oh god. When the green blanket reached Marie at the far end of the room, Ashley stood and said, excuse me, bathroom break. And Marlene said, you know where it is, right? And Ashley said that she did. A set of baby bath towels came around, and Ashley's chair was still empty. Olive handed them to the girl on the other side of the empty chair, and then she stood and said, I'll be back. In the kitchen Olive found Ashley, bent over the sink, saying, oh god, oh god. Are you all right? Olive said loudly. The girl shook her head. You're in labor, Olive said. The girl looked at her then, her face was wet. I think I am, she said. This morning I thought maybe I'd had a contraction, but then I didn't have any more, and now oh god, she said, and she bent over, clinging to the edge of the sink. Let's get you to the hospital, Olive said. In a moment, Ashley stood straight, Karma. I just don't want to spoil this, it's so important to her. You know she whispered this to Olive I don't know if Rick is even going to marry her. Who cares, Olive said. You're about to have a baby. To hell with spoiling it for her. They won't even notice you're gone. Yes, they will. And then the attention will be on me. And it should be on Ashley's face wrinkled and she held the edge of the sink again. Oh God, oh God, she said. I'm getting my bag and driving you to the hospital right now, Olive said, aware that she was using her schoolteacher's voice. She walked back into the living room and retrieved her big black bag. People were laughing at something, loud laughter poured into Olive's ears. Olive? It was Marlene's voice coming to her. Olive raised a hand above her head and went back to the kitchen, where Ashley was panting. Help me, Ashley said, she was weeping. Come on, Olive said, pushing the girl toward the door. That's my car right there, on the lawn. Get in it. Marlene appeared and said, what's happening? She's in labor, Olive said, and I'm taking her to the hospital. But I didn't want to spoil things, Ashley said to Marlene, she stood there, confusion on her wet face. Now, said Olive. Right now. In my car. On the lawn. Oh, Olive, let's call an ambulance. What if she has the baby while you're driving? Stay here, Olive. Let me call. Marlene reached for the phone on the wall and it seemed to take forever for someone to answer. Olive said, well, I'm taking her, so you can tell whoever you get what my car looks like and they can follow me if they want. But what does your car look like? Marlene seemed to wail this. Take a look at it, Olive commanded. Ashley had already gone through the doorway and was getting into the back seat of Olive's car. Tell the ambulance driver to pull me over if he shows up. As she opened the back door of her car, Olive saw the girl's face and realized, this is it. This girl was going to have her baby. Take your pants off, Olive said to her. Now. Take them off. Ashley tried, but she was writhing in pain, and Olive looked through her bag, her hands shaking and found the shears she always carried with her. Lie back. Olive leaned into the car, but she was afraid she would poke the girl's belly with the shears, so she went around to the door on the other side and opened that, and she was able to cut the pants successfully. Then she walked back around the car again and pulled the pants off the girl. Stay lying back, she said firmly, oh, she was a school teacher all right. The girl spread her knees, and Olive stared. She was amazed. Pudendum went through her mind. She had never seen a young woman's pudendum. My word! The amount of hair and it was well, it was wide open. There was blood and gooey stuff coming out, what a thing! Ashley was making grunting sounds, and Olive said, okay, okay, stay calm. She had absolutely no idea what she was supposed to do. Stay calm. She yelled this. 
she reached and touched Ashley's knees, opening them more. In a few minutes Olive had no idea how many minutes Ashley let out a huge sound, a large groan and screech combined. And out slipped something. Olive thought the girl had not delivered a baby at all, but rather some lumpish thing, almost like clay. Then Olive saw the face, the eyes, the arms oh my goodness, she said. You have a baby. She was hardly aware of the man's hand on her shoulder as he said, all right then, let's see what we have. He was from the ambulance, she had not even heard it drive in. But when she turned and saw his face, so in charge, she felt a rush of love for him. Marlene stood on the lawn, tears streaming down her face. Oh, Olive, she said. Oh, my word. Olive stood up now and walked through her house. It felt no longer a house but more a nest where a mouse lived. It had felt this way for a long time. She sat down in the small kitchen, then she got up and walked past the bump-out room, as she and Henry had called it, now with the purple quilt spread messily on the large window seat this is where Olive had slept since her husband's death and then she went back to the living room, where pale water streaks from last winter's snow showed on the wallpaper near the fireplace. She sat on the big chair by the window and rocked her foot up and down. The evenings were interminable these days, and she remembered when she had loved the long evenings. Across the bay the sun twinkled, now low in the sky. A shaft of light cut over the floorboards and onto the rug in the living room. Olive's unease grew, she could almost not stand it. She rocked her foot higher and higher, and then when the sky had just turned dark she said out loud, let's get this over with. She dialed Jack Kennison's number. She had lain down beside the man almost a month ago, it still felt like she had dreamed it. Well, if Bertha Babcock answered the phone, Olive would just hang up. Or if any woman did. Jack answered on the second ring. Hello, he said, sounding bored. Is this Olive Kittredge calling? How did you know that, she asked, a wave of terror went through her as though he could see her sitting in her house. Oh, I have a thing called caller ID, so I always know who's calling. And this says hold on, let me take another look yes, this says Henry Kitteridge. And we know it can't be Henry. So I thought perhaps it was you. Hello, Olive. How are you tonight? I'm very glad you called. I was wondering if we'd ever speak again. I've missed you, Olive. I delivered a baby two days ago. Olive said this sitting on the edge of her chair, looking through the window at the darkened bay. There was a moment before Jack said, you did. You delivered a baby. She told him the story, leaning back a bit, holding the phone with one hand, then switching it to the other. Jack roared with laughter. I love that, Olive. My God, you delivered a baby. That's wonderful. Well, when I called my son and told him, he didn't think it was so wonderful. He sounded I don't know how he sounded. Just wanted to talk about himself. She felt she heard Jack considering this. Then he said, oh, Olive, that boy of yours is a great disappointment. Yes, he is, she said. Come over, Jack told her. Get in your car and come on over to see me. Now? It's dark out. If you don't drive in the dark, I'll come pick you up, he said. I still drive in the dark. I'll see you soon. Goodbye, she said, and hung up. She went and got her new jacket that was hanging in the bathroom, the spot was dry. Jack was wearing a short-sleeved shirt, and his arms looked flabby. His stomach seemed huge beneath his shirt but Olive's stomach was big too, she knew this. At least her hind end was covered up. Jack's blue eyes twinkled slightly as he bowed and ushered her inside. Hello, Olive. Olive wished she had not come. May I take your jacket, he asked, and she said, nope. She added, it's part of my outfit. She saw him look at her jacket, and he said, very nice. I made it yesterday, she said, and Jack said, you made that? 
I did. Well, I'm impressed. Have a seat. And Jack brought her into the living room, where the windows were dark from the outside. He nodded to an armchair and sat down in the one opposite it. You're nervous, he said. And just as she was about to answer him what in hell did she have to be nervous about, he said, I am too. Then he added, but we're grown-ups, and we'll manage. I suppose we will, she said. She thought he could have been nicer about her new jacket. Looking around, she was disappointed at what she saw, a wooden carved duck, a lampshade with a ruffle had this stuff been there all along. It must have been and she had not noticed it, how could she not have noticed such foolishness? My daughter's upset with me, Jack said. I told you that she's a lesbian. Yes, you did. And I told you. I know, Olive. You told me I was a beast to care. And I thought about it, and I decided you were right. So I called her a few days ago and I tried, I tried in a goofy way to tell her that I knew I was a shit. She'd have none of it. I suppose she thinks I'm just so lonely with her mother gone that now I've decided to accept her. Jack sighed, he looked tired, and he put a hand over his thinning hair. Is that true? Olive asked. Well, I wondered. I gave it some thought. And I don't know. It could be true. But it's also true that your response got me thinking. Jack shook his head slowly, looking down at his socks, which made Olive look down at them as well, and she was surprised to see his toe sticking out of a hole in one. His toenail needed to be cut. God, that's unattractive, he said. He covered his toe with his other foot briefly, then let it loose. My point here is children. Your son. My daughter. They don't like us, Olive. Olive considered this. No, she finally agreed. I don't think Christopher does like me. Why is that? Jack said, looking up at her, his head on one hand, you are a crummy mother. Who knows, Olive. He could have just been born that way too. Olive sat and looked at her hands, which she held together on her lap. Jack said, wait a minute. Didn't he just have a new baby? It died. She had to wait and push the baby out dead. Oh, Olive, that's awful. God, that's an awful thing. Now Jack sat up straight. Yep. It is. Olive whisked some lint off the knee of her black pants. Well, maybe that's why he didn't want to hear you talking about how you delivered one. Jack gave a shrug. I'm just saying. No. You're right. Of course. The thought had not occurred to her, and she felt her face grow warm. Anyway, she's trying to get pregnant again and this one will be born in a pool. A little kiddie swimming pool. That's what he told me. Jack leaned his head back and laughed. Olive was surprised at the sound of his laughter it was so genuine. Jack. She spoke sharply. Yes, Olive. He said this with dry humor. I have to tell you how stupid that baby shower was. Marlene's daughter well, the poor girl sat in a chair and put all her ribbons on a paper plate and then every single damned gift had to be passed around from one woman to the next. Every single gift. And everyone said, oh, how lovely, and isn't that nice, and honest to good God, Jack, I thought I would die. He watched her for a moment, then his eyes crinkled with mirth. Olive, he finally said, I don't know where you've been. I tried calling you a few times, and I thought perhaps you'd gone to New York to see your grandson. You don't have an answering machine. I could have sworn you did, I've left you messages on it before. I've never seen my grandson, Olive said. And of course I have an answering machine. Then Olive said, oh. I turned it off one day, someone kept calling me about a vacation I'd won. Maybe I never turned it back on. She understood now that this was true, she had never turned the damned machine back on. Jack was quiet, he studied his toenail. 
Then he looked up and said, well, let's get you a cell phone. I will buy it for you, and I will show you how to use it. Now, why haven't you seen your grandson? A ripple of something went through Olive, almost a fleeting sense of unreality. This man, Jack Kennison, was going to buy her a cell phone. She said, because I haven't been invited. I told you how badly things went when I went to New York before. Yes, you did. Have you invited them to come see you? No. Olive looked at the lampshade with its ruffle around the bottom. Why don't you do that? Because they have those three kids, I told you she had two different kids with two different men and they have little Henry now, and I'm sure they couldn't make the trip. Jack opened a hand. Maybe not. But I think it would be nice for you to invite them. They don't need to be invited, they can just come. Olive put both hands on the armchair's armrests, then put them back in her lap. Jack leaned forward, his elbows on his knees. Olive, sometimes people like to be invited. I, for example, would have loved to be invited to your house on many occasions, but you've not invited me except for that one time when I asked you to take me over. And so I have felt rebuffed. Do you see that? Olive exhaled loudly. You could have called. Olive, I just told you I did call. I called you a couple of times, and because you turned off your frigging answering machine, you didn't know I called. He sat back and wagged a finger at her. Only pointing out here that people can't read your mind. And I sent you an email as well. Eh ya, Olive said. Well, I don't call a bunch of question marks an email. I like you, Olive. Jack gave her half a smile, then shook his head slightly. I'm not sure why, really. But I do. Eh ya, said Olive again, and her face felt warm again, but they talked then. They talked of their children, and after a while Jack told her about his day a few days ago, how he was stopped by the police for speeding. They were unbelievably rude to me, Olive. You would have thought I was wanted for murder, the way both of them spoke to me. Jack opened his hand in dismay after he said this to her. Probably thought you were an out-of-stater. I have main plates. Olive shrugged. Still, you're an old man running around in your zippy little sports car. They know an out-of-stater when they see one. Olive raised her eyebrows. I'm perfectly serious, Jack. They could smell you a mile away. She glanced down at the huge watch of Henry's she was wearing. It's late, she said, and she stood up. Olive, would you stay here tonight? Jack shifted in his chair. No, no, just listen to me. Right now I am wearing a half diaper because of prostate surgery I had right before Betsy was diagnosed. What? asked Olive. I'm just trying to reassure you. I'm not going to assault you. You do know what depends are, right? Depends, asked Olive. What do you mean? Oh. She realized she had seen them on television ads. I'm telling you that I'm wearing half a depends, a thing for people who pee their pants. Men who pee after this surgery. They say it will get better, but it hasn't yet. Olive, I'm only telling you this because. She waved her hand for him to stop. Godfrey, Jack, she said. I'd say you've been through quite a lot. But she was aware of feeling relief. Jack said, why don't you stay in the guest room, and I will stay in the guest room across the hall. I just want you here when I wake up, Olive. Just when you wake up? Well, I'll come back. I get up early. When he didn't answer, she added, I don't have my nightgown or my toothbrush. And I don't think I'd sleep a wink. Jack nodded. I get that. About the toothbrush we have a few new unused toothbrushes, don't ask me why. But Betsy always had extra on hand, and I can give you a t-shirt, if you care to wear it. They were silent, and Olive understood. He wanted her there for the whole night. What was she going to do? Go home to the rat's nest she now lived in. 
Yes, she was. At the doorway, she turned. Jack, she said. Listen to me. I'm listening. He had remained in his chair. She stood there, staring at the ridiculous lampshade with its ruffled business going on. I just don't want to have to bump into you talking to that Bertha Babcock in the grocery store. Bertha Babcock, that's her name. God, I couldn't remember her name. He sat back and clapped his hands once. She talks about the weather, Olive. The weather. Look, Olive, I'm just saying, I would like you to stay here tonight. I promise, you get your own room, and so do I. She came close. She did. But then she said, I will see you in the morning, if you like. It wasn't until she had pulled open the door that Jack rose and went to the door as well. He waved his hand. Goodbye, then. Good night, Jack. She waved her hand over her head. Outside, the evening air assaulted her with the smells of the field and she heard the peepers as she walked to her car. Reaching for the handle of her car door, she thought, Olive, you fool. She pictured herself at home, sleeping on the big window seat in the bump-out room, she thought how she would listen to the little transistor radio against her ear all night, as she had since Henry died. She turned and walked back to Jack's door. She rang the bell, and Jack answered the door almost immediately. All right, she said. She used the new toothbrush that his poor dead wife had somehow bought, Olive didn't have an extra toothbrush in her house, then she closed the door of the guest room with the double bed, and pulled on a huge t-shirt he had given her. The t-shirt smelled of fresh laundry and something else vaguely cinnamon. It did not smell like Henry. She thought, this is the stupidest thing I have ever done. And then she thought, it's no stupider than that stupid baby shower I went to. She folded her clothes and put them on the chair by the bed. She was not unhappy. Then she opened the door a crack. She could just see that he had settled himself into the single bed in the guest room across the hall. Jack, she called to him. Yes, Olive, he called back. This is the stupidest thing I've ever done. She didn't know why she had said that. The stupidest thing you ever did was go to that baby shower, he called back, and Olive felt stunned for a moment. Except for the baby you delivered, he called out. She left the door partly open and got into bed and turned over on her side, away from the door. Good night, Jack. She practically yelled the words. Good night, Olive. That night. It was as though waves swung her up and then down, tossing her high high and then the darkness came from below and she felt terror and struggled. Because she saw that her life her life, what a silly foolish notion, her life that her life was different, might possibly be very different or might not be different at all, and both ideas were unspeakably awful to her, except for when the waves took her high and she felt such gladness, but it did not last long, and she was down again, deep under the waves, and it was like that back and forth, up and down, she was exhausted and could not sleep. It was not until dawn broke that she drifted off. Good morning, Jack said. He stood, his hair messy, in the doorway of her room. He wore a bathrobe that was navy blue and stopped halfway down his calves. He was unfamiliar, she felt put off. Olive flapped a hand from the bed. Go away, she said. I'm sleeping. He roared with laughter. And what a sound it was, Olive felt a physical sensation, a thrill. At the very same time she felt terror, as though a match had been lit on her and she had been soaked in oil. The terror, the thrill of his laughter it was nightmarish, but also as though a huge can she had been stuffed into had just opened. I mean it, Olive said. She turned over in the bed. Right now. Go away, Jack, she said. She squeezed her eyes shut. Please, she thought. But she did not know what she meant by that. Please, she thought again. Please. Cleaning. Kaylee Callahan was a young girl in the eighth grade, and she lived in a small apartment with her mother on Dyer Road in the town of Crosby, Maine, 
her father had died two years earlier. Her mother was a petite, anxious woman, and because her mother had not wanted to rely on her three older daughters, or with families, she had sold the big house they had lived in on Maple Avenue to an out-of-state couple who found the price to be extremely cheap and who came up on weekends to renovate it. The house on Maple Avenue was near Kaylee's school, and every day she walked a block over so as to avoid going by the place where her father had died in the back room. It was early March, and the day had been cloudy until just now, sunlight came through the windows of Kaylee's English classroom. Kaylee, leaning her head on her hand, was thinking about her father, he was a man without higher education, but when she was small he had told her about the famine that took place in Ireland, and the corn laws that made bread too expensive to buy, he had told her many things, in her mind now she envisioned people on the streets of Ireland, dying, bodies falling on the side of the road. Mrs. Ringrose was standing in front of the class with the vocabulary book, held with both hands, on top of her protruding chest. She said, use it three times and it's yours, which is what she always said when they were doing vocabulary words. Mrs. Ringrose was old, with white hair and glasses that wobbled on her nose, they were gold-rimmed. Obstreperous, Mrs. Ringrose said. She looked over the students seated at their desks, sunlight glinting off her glasses. Christine? And poor Christine Lab could not come up with anything. Um, I don't know. Mrs. Ringrose didn't like that. Kaylee, she asked. Kaylee sat up straight. The dog was really obstreperous, she said. All right, Mrs. Ringrose said. Two more. Kaylee knew what most people in town knew about the Ringroses. At Thanksgiving they dressed up like pilgrims and went around the schools in the state, giving talks on the first Thanksgivings in New England, Mrs. Ringrose always took two days off from teaching to do this, the only days she ever took off. The children playing were being really obstreperous, said Kaylee. Mrs. Ringrose did not look pleased. One more, Kaylee, and it's yours. Kaylee also knew, because Mrs. Ringrose talked about this a lot, that one of Mrs. Ringrose's ancestors had come over on the Mayflower ship from England many years ago. Kaylee closed her eyes briefly, then she finally said, My father said the English people thought the Irish were obstreperous, and Mrs. Ringrose glanced at the ceiling and snapped the vocabulary book shut. Okay, I suppose that's good enough. You now have the word, Kaylee. Sitting in the classroom on the second floor while afternoon sun streamed through the windows, Kaylee felt an emptiness in her stomach that was not hunger but a kind of vague nausea, the feeling Kaylee did not know why had something to do with Mrs. Ringrose, whose first name was Doris. Doris Ringrose, and her husband was named Phil. They had no children. See me after class, Mrs. Ringrose said to Kaylee. A week earlier Kaylee had come home from cleaning the house of Bertha Babcock which she did every Wednesday after school and heard her eldest sister, Brenda, speaking with their mother in the kitchen. Kaylee had stood by the door in the darkened hallway, the staircase she had just come up was steep and wooden and lit by only one light bulb, her backpack with her school books was unsteady on her shoulder, and she heard Brenda say, but, mom, he wants it all the time, and it's kind of making me sick. And her mother replied, Brenda, he's your husband, it's what you have to do. Kaylee hesitated, but they stopped talking then, and when she came in, Brenda stood up and said, hi, honey. What have you been up to? Brenda was many years older than Kaylee, and she used to be a pretty woman with her dark red hair and smooth complexion, but lately there were brown patches beneath her eyes and she had been gaining weight. Cleaning house for Bertha Babcock, said Kaylee, slipping her backpack off. I can't stand it. She took her coat off and added, I can't stand her. Lighting a cigarette, Kaylee's mother said, Well, she can't stand you either, don't think otherwise. You're Irish, you're just a servant to her. She dropped the match into the saucer of her teacup and said, Directing this to Brenda, she's a congregationalist, Bertha Babcock, and gave her a meaningful nod. Brenda tugged on her blue cardigan but it wouldn't meet in the middle across her stomach. Still, it's a nice thing you're doing it. She winked at Kaylee. 
Mrs. Ringrose is going to ask me to clean her house now too, Kaylee said. Mrs. Babcock recommended me. All right then, her mother said, as though she didn't care, and she may not have. Another congregationalist. Brenda asked this playfully, and Kaylee said, I think so. Kaylee went into her bedroom, the old wooden door never closed all the way, and as Kaylee listened to the women talking now in muted tones she understood that this was about sex, her sister didn't want to have sex with Ed, and Kaylee didn't blame her. He was okay, her brother-in-law, but he was a small man, and had bad teeth, and it made Kaylee feel queer in her stomach to think that he wanted it all the time. Kaylee sat down on her bed and thought she would never ever marry someone like Ed. And she would never get old like Bertha Babcock, who was a widow, and whose kitchen floor was in black and white tiles, which Mrs. Babcock made Kaylee clean with a toothbrush between the tiles each week, Kaylee could not stand it. The Babcock house seemed to stink with a loneliness there would be no cure for. Brenda came to the door of Kaylee's bedroom, the room was small, and lit now by the overhead light that shone on Kaylee's pink quilt, which lay messily on her bed, and as Brenda slipped on her coat she said to Kaylee, I have to get going, honey, the kids will need their supper. Brenda lived two towns away. Then she said, Mom says you're still not playing the piano. Brenda asked, conspiratorially, quietly, should she sell it, honey? Kaylee stood up to give her sister a hug goodbye. No, please don't let her sell it. Kaylee added, I'll play, I promise. It was their father who had played the piano, although after Kaylee learned to play he said he would rather listen to Kaylee. I love you, and I love the piano, so the combination just sends me to heaven, their father had said, standing in the doorway of their old living room. That night Kaylee sat at the piano, which was an old black upright. But she played badly because she almost never played anymore, and even the simpler sonatas of Mozart were not as easy for her as they had once been. Kaylee put the lid down over the keyboard. I'll play more, she said to her mother, who was sitting in the corner smoking a cigarette near the window she had cracked partly open, and her mother did not answer. Kaylee spent the rest of the evening in her bedroom, watching on her computer Martin Luther King, Jr., giving his I Have a Dream speech. This was an assignment for social studies class, but her father had told her about that speech as well. The Ringrose house also had a loneliness about it. But it was a different flavor than Bertha Babcock's place, and the house was smaller it was a cape on River Road, and it had on the front of it a small board that said 1742 and also somehow cleaner, Kaylee didn't have to work so hard. The first day she was there, Mrs. Ringrose told her she was to clean the logs in the fireplace each week with a cleaning fluid that Kaylee was to put in a pail of warm water, the logs were birch, and their bark was a whitish grey and she was to clean the wooden floors on her hands and knees, Mrs. Ringrose said, and Kaylee didn't care, she was young, it wasn't the endless kitchen of the Babcock home. In the living room on a table all by itself was a wooden model of the Mayflower. Kaylee was not to touch this, Mrs. Ringrose said that first day, holding up her finger. Do. Not. Touch. Then she told Kaylee how she was a direct descendant of Miles Standish, who had come over on this ship, and if you looked at it Mrs. Ringrose peered down at the model you could see where the people stayed, and Kaylee murmured, oh yeah, although she thought of her father then, and how, when he was sick in the back room, she would watch the movie with him about Michael Collins and the green tank of the English that came into Croke Park and started shooting all the Irish people. Kaylee stepped back from Mrs. Ringrose. Being so close to her allowed Kaylee to see the patches of pink scalp through her white hair, it gave Kaylee that sense of nausea again. But also on that first day it was the strangest thing Mrs. Ringrose made Kaylee try on her wedding gown. The gown was yellow in places, and spread out on Mrs. Ringrose's bed. Mrs. Ringrose had a separate bedroom and bathroom from her husband. Just try it on, Kaylee. You're about the size I was when I got married and I would like to see this gown on someone. She gave a little nod. Come on now, she said. Kaylee looked behind her, then back at Mrs. Ringrose. Slowly she unbuttoned her blouse, and Mrs. Ringrose kept standing there watching her, 
So Kaylee took her blouse off, and then she unzipped her jeans and took them off too, after slipping off her sneakers. She stood in her underpants and her bra in front of this woman as a milky sunlight came through the windows of the bedroom, tiny goosebumps went over her arms and legs. Mrs. Ringrose held the dress above Kaylee's head, and it slipped down over her body, fitting her easily. Mrs. Ringrose took her glasses off and wiped her eyes with her other hand. There was water still on her cheeks when she put her glasses back on. Now listen, Mrs. Ringrose said, touching Kaylee's shoulder. I've started a group at our church, and it's called the Silver Squares. There's already one group called the Golden Circle, but they're old, and so I have started the Silver Squares and we're going to have a fashion show in June, and I would like you to play the piano for it and wear my wedding dress. With the woman still watching her, Kaylee got into her own clothes again. Except for Kaylee's first time at the Ringroses, Mrs. Ringrose was never there. I'll be off at the Silver Squares, she had said. Kaylee got the key from under the mat and let herself in, as she had been instructed to do. A ten dollar bill was always left on the kitchen table for her. But the Ringroses' house really depressed Kaylee in a powerful way. For example, Mr. Ringrose's bathroom was designed to look like an outhouse. There was a dark green painted barrel around a flush toilet, so it looked like you were going to sit on a hole. Rough wooden planks were on the walls. Kaylee had never spoken to Mr. Ringrose, he was not there when she cleaned, and she knew who he was only because she'd seen him around town with Mrs. Ringrose, he was tall, old, white-haired, four years he had worked in Portland at some history museum, but he had long been retired. There was no sink in his bathroom, just those barn boards with the dark green barrel in the middle. Mrs. Ringrose's bathroom was normal, white porcelain with a sink and a vanity table with her hairbrush on it and hairpins. In the living room, the couch was small and tightly upholstered. The seat rounded up into a mound, and when Kaylee sat on it she felt she might almost slip off. The chairs were the same. The upholstery was a deep rose color, and on the dark green walls were paintings of people that looked like weird dolls, they looked a little bit like grown-ups, except for how short they were, and they wore white hats and dresses that were from a different era, these pictures Kaylee could not stand. She could not stand them. How does she even know you play the piano? asked Christine Lab. She and Kaylee were walking on the sidewalk, close to the center of town by the donut shop, and Christine was eating a donut that had cinnamon all over it. Christine's eyes had dark blue liner around them, and part of it was smudged. I don't know. Kaylee turned to look at the cars going by. Maybe she heard me playing that piano they have in the gym. I don't know how she knows. Christine said, she's creepy. Her husband's creepy too. Dressing up like stupid pilgrims every year and talking about that stupid fucking Mayflower ship her ancestors came over on. Reciting that stupid Longfellow poem The Courtship of Miles Standish while kids yawn their fucking heads off. You should see their house, Kaylee said, and she described Mr. Ringrose's bathroom. Christine looked at her and said, Jesus holy Christ. Then Kaylee touched her eye to show Christine that her makeup was smudged, and Christine shrugged and took another bite of her donut. On Saturday afternoon Kaylee rode her bicycle to the nursing home out past the bridge where Miss Minnie was. It was cold in mid-March, but there was very little snow, and Kaylee's bicycle bumped over twigs that had fallen onto the sidewalk, her hands were cold because she wore no gloves. Miss Minnie used to live in the apartment above the one Kaylee lived in now with her mother, Miss Minnie had lived there for years, and she was the first person Kaylee had cleaned for. The old woman was tiny, with enormous dark eyes, and Kaylee had been astonished at the grime, especially in the kitchen, that had built up over time. And so Kaylee scrubbed and scrubbed while Miss Minnie peered into the doorway and said, Oh, what a lovely job you're doing, Kaylee. Miss Minnie would clap her hands, she was that excited at Kaylee's work, and Kaylee loved her for this. Miss Minnie always gave Kaylee a glass of orange juice when she was done, and Miss Minnie would sit across the table from her, leaning forward toward Kaylee, and ask questions about her school and her friends, no one had asked Kaylee about these things since her father died. 
After Miss Minnie had her stroke last fall, Kaylee went to visit her in the nursing home, even though the place was dark and smelled bad. Miss Minnie would thank her many times for coming. It's okay, Kaylee would say, I like seeing you, and after the first few visits she gave Miss Minnie a kiss when she left, and the old lady's enormous dark eyes would glow. Kaylee locked her bike out behind the nursing home, and as she went around to the front door, Mrs. Kitteridge was just coming out. Hello again, Mrs. Kitteridge said to her, she was a big woman, tall, and when Kaylee had first met her here a month ago, she had seemed a little frightening. Now Mrs. Kitteridge held the door open for Kaylee, and she said, you're quite a kid, coming to visit someone in this place. God, I hope to hell when I get to this stage, someone just shoots me. Kaylee said, I know. Me too. I mean I hope they shoot me too. Mrs. Kitteridge put her sunglasses on and looked Kaylee up and down and said, well, you won't have to worry about it for a while. She let the door close, and they stood together in the pale March Sunday. Say, I did some snooping and found out you're the Callahan girl. I had your sisters in school years ago. Your father was our postman. He was a good man, I'm sorry he died. Thank you, Kaylee said. A sudden warmth moved through her, that this woman knew who her father had been. Kaylee said, were you here visiting your friend? Mrs. Kitteridge gave a big sigh, looking through her sunglasses up at the sky. Yes. Horrible. The whole thing. But listen, glancing back at Kaylee now, you said last time you used to clean for Miss Minnie, and I have another old woman who's looking for a house cleaner. Bertha Babcock. She's an old horror, but she'd be okay to you. I'll tell her to call you, shall I? She already found me, said Kaylee. I work there on Wednesday afternoons. I started a few weeks ago. Mrs. Kitteridge shook her head in what appeared to be sympathy. Kaylee said, and now I have to clean for Mrs. Ringrose too. She's my English teacher. I know who she is. Another old horror. Well, good luck. And Mrs. Kitteridge stepped away, tossing a hand over her head. The nursing home was dark, and it still smelled bad, of course. Miss Minnie was asleep, and so Kaylee sat down on the one chair in the room. On the table by Miss Minnie's bed was a photograph of a young man in uniform, and beside this photograph was a bunch of fake violets. The same photo and the same violets had been by Miss Minnie's bed in her apartment. The photo was of Miss Minnie's brother, Kaylee found this out one day when Miss Minnie picked up the photo and held it to her chest and told Kaylee how he had died in the Korean War. It made Kaylee sad, she would have much rather it had been a man Miss Minnie had loved who was not related to her. Now Kaylee sat, waiting for Miss Minnie to wake up. An aide came in, a big woman in a blue uniform, and said, she hasn't woken up all afternoon. She's depressed. She's sleeping more and more. Together Kaylee and this woman looked at Miss Minnie, and then Kaylee stood and said, okay. But can you tell her I was here? Please? The woman glanced at her watch. I get off in an hour. If she wakes before then, I'll tell her. I'll leave her a note, Kaylee said, and so the big woman went and found a piece of paper and a pencil and Kaylee wrote in large letters, H I miss Minnie. It's me, Kaylee. I came to visit you but you were sleeping. I will come back. One day when Kaylee's father was very sick, he had motioned to her from where he lay on his bed, and Kaylee had gone and put her ear to his mouth, and he said, you've always been my favorite child. After a moment he added, your mother's favorite is Brenda. His lips had a white gumminess in the corners. I love you, daddy, Kaylee said, with a tissue, she wiped his lips carefully, and her father looked at her with warmth in his eyes. But she thought about this often the fact that her father had said she was his favorite child. And she thought about her mother, who had always been a distracted woman and who worked part-time now at a dental office in town, it seemed she had little to say to Kaylee in the evenings, and often Kaylee's feelings were hurt by this, 
Kaylee could actually feel a small wave of pain go through her chest at times, and she would think, this is why they say a person's feelings are hurt, because they do hurt. The next week that Kaylee worked at the Ringrose house she felt that same feeling she always got in their house, a stark feeling of dismalness. The day was tremendously sunny, the light poured through the windows of the living room, and after Kaylee had washed the logs in the fireplace she sat down on the couch with the upholstery that was stiff and hard. A strong sensual impulse suddenly went through her, as though the chasteness of the house was screaming for her. She sat there as the feeling grew, and after a moment she slowly undid the first button on her blouse and put her hand down under her bra and felt her breast and a glow went through her. She closed her eyes and undid the second button of her blouse and pulled her breast from the cup of her bra. In the stillness of the house her breast seemed vulnerable and alive to her, she touched her fingers to her mouth and then back to her breast and she kept touching her breast, filled with unbelievable sensations. She sat with her eyes closed, touching her breast, feeling the air touching it as well it was oddly thrilling, doing this in the strangeness and silence of the Ringrose home. A small sound made her eyes open, and in the doorway of the living room stood Mr. Ringrose. Kaylee sat up straight and tried to close her blouse, her cheeks became flaming hot. The man was tall and he stood there watching her behind his glasses, not smiling. Without saying anything Mr. Ringrose gave the tiniest nod, and in the blurriness of the moment Kaylee somehow understood he wanted her to continue. She stared at him and then said or tried to say no, but he spoke first, and his voice was thick. Go on. She shook her head, but he kept watching her, and a kind expression appeared on his face. Go on, he said again, quietly. She stared at him, she was tremendously frightened. And he seemed to know it, because his expression of kindness grew, he tilted his head slightly down. He said quietly, please go on. They watched each other, and his eyes he wore large rimless glasses seemed kind and oddly harmless, and so in a moment she closed her eyes and touched her breast again. When she opened her eyes, he was gone. She buttoned her blouse hurriedly and stood up, she finished her dusting with her cheeks still hot, she felt a breathlessness as she went about the place, washing the floor on her hands and knees. Her mind kept thinking, oh my god, oh my god, oh my god. She almost didn't see it as she was leaving, the envelope on the mat by the front door as she left the house, and then bending down she saw that it had her last name on it. She took the envelope, and when she turned the corner she opened it and found three twenty-dollar bills. Now Kaylee felt a different fear. She stuck the money in her back pocket, still in the envelope, and rode her bicycle far out of town. Oh my god, oh my god, she kept saying. When she came home, her mother said, where were you? Kaylee said she had been riding her bike after cleaning for the ring roses, it was such a gorgeous day. And then Kaylee sat down at the piano and began to play oh, how she played. She went through the sonatas of Mozart as though she could not dig her fingers deep enough into the fresh soil of the music, she played and played. As they sat eating supper, her mother said, you've barely touched that piano since your father died, and it's sitting right there taking up all that space. Kaylee said, I'll keep playing. Please don't get rid of it. The next week it was raining and Kaylee rode her bike to the Ringrose house with her raincoat on and her hood over her head but she was still dripping wet when she got there, and again there was no sign of either of them. She dried herself as best she could with a towel from the kitchen and went to work, getting the pail with the cleaning fluid for the logs, and as she was kneeling and running a cloth over the logs in the fireplace there must have been a sound she looked up, Mr. Ringrose was standing exactly where he had been standing the time before. A few raindrops were on the shoulders of his pale blue shirt, and also on his glasses, but she could still see his eyes. He simply stood there looking at her, and she did not speak. After a moment he gave her the tiniest nod, and she sat back on her heels and put her hand over her breast and he nodded the tiny nod again, and after another moment Kaylee slowly stood, drying her hands on her jeans, and she went and sat back on the stiff couch, and she undid her blouse, this time watching him. For Kaylee there was a sense of unreality to it as she took her blouse off slowly, then took her bra off, and the air in the room seemed to leap at her bare breasts, 
and the rain outside beat down on the windows. The man said in a low voice, thank you. On the mat by the front door was once again the envelope filled with cash. When Kaylee was very young she had asked her mother one day if she was pretty, and her mother said, well, you're not going to win any beauty contests, but you're not going to be in a freak show either. In fact, not long before her father died, Kaylee she was in the sixth grade then was asked to be in a beauty contest. Her gym teacher called her aside and asked if she would take part in the Little Miss Moxie competition in the town of Shirley Falls, Kaylee's father was furious. No daughter of mine will be judged on how she looks. He was really angry about it, and so Kaylee told her teacher no, she couldn't do it, and Kaylee didn't care about it one way or another. Yet these days she would stare at herself in the mirror in her bedroom, turning her head one way, then another. She thought some nights she thought this that she might be pretty. She did not take her shirt and bra off in front of the mirror to see what Mr. Ringrow saw. That was not something she could do, but she thought about the man almost constantly. June arrived. School would be over in two weeks. In the activities room of the congregational church, Kaylee sat on the piano bench dressed in Mrs. Ringrow's wedding dress. It was an unseasonably hot day, and a big fan stood nearby squeaking slightly as it twirled the air around. Folded chairs were set up with an aisle between them, and the old wooden floor creaked as women walked across it, settling themselves into the chairs. Through the windows a bright blue sky could be seen, and also part of the parking LOT. Every week for nine weeks now, Kaylee had taken her blouse off for Mr. Ringrose one time only he did not show up, and Kaylee felt bereft and the cash-filled envelopes, which she had stuffed in the bureau drawer beneath her underpants and socks, had become so much she had taken them and hidden them in her closet. It was odd, because sometimes there were sixty dollars, and a few times there was just a ten and a few ones, and once there were two twenties. As Kaylee sat on the piano bench, she watched Mrs. Ringrose walking around the activities room and thought, your husband has seen my breasts and I'll bet you he hasn't seen yours in years. This thought made her extremely happy. Mrs. Ringrose finally gave her the nod, and Kaylee began to play pomp and circumstance, and the first woman who was in the Silver Squares fashion show walked down the little aisle between the folding chairs, wearing a long dress and a white cap over her grey-haired head, Mrs. Ringrose stood in the front of the room and said, the first pilgrims, 1620. Perhaps fifteen old women sat in the chairs that were set up for fifty, and Kaylee kept playing as Mrs. Ringrose stood behind a lectern and said who each person was, and what period of time it was about whatever they were wearing. Bertha Babcock came last, she wore an orange pantsuit. The modern era, Mrs. Ringrose said, and they all clapped lightly. Afterward the women sat on the folding chairs eating cookies with thin paper napkins on their laps. No one spoke to Kaylee, and so in a while she went and changed out of the wedding gown and put it on the table in the front of the room, then she rode her bicycle home. Christine Lab stared at her from her blue made-up eyes, then burst out laughing. How nauseating, she said, and she laughed and laughed, coughing, bending over. It was, Kaylee said. It was just so stupid. You think? And Christine coughed again and said, Jesus mother of Mary, Kaylee. What a stupid fucking thing. She's retiring this year, you know. Kaylee said she didn't know. She gazed at a truck parked nearby, it had a bumper sticker on it that said, rednecks needed. Freckles okay. Oh yeah. The student council was getting all weepy about it and they're going to present her with a lilac bush on the last day of school. Christine rolled her eyes. Who cares? I don't care, that's for sure, Kaylee said. At home these nights Kaylee played the piano, she played and played, and she became good at it again. Up and down the keyboard her fingers flew. At the nursing home, Miss Minnie sat slumped over a tray table, her head resting on her arms, her eyes closed. Miss Minnie? Kaylee whispered, leaning toward the old woman. Miss Minnie? But the old woman did not respond, she did not move, or open her eyes. 
She had been like this exactly like this the last two times Kaylee had ridden her bike out to the nursing home. The same aide came in, in her blue uniform, and she stood with her hands on her hips, watching Miss Minnie. Oh, honey, she finally said to Kaylee. She's just real old, and real depressed. Kaylee leaned down toward Miss Minnie, and she spoke quietly into her ear, feeling the woman's fine hair against her mouth. Miss Minnie, it's me, Kaylee. Listen, Miss Minnie? And then Kaylee said, I love you. And the woman did not move. The next time Kaylee visited, Miss Minnie's room was empty completely empty, no bed, no chair and there were two women in it cleaning with mops. Wait. Kaylee said, but they just kept swirling their mops, and when Kaylee went to the front desk, the woman there said, I'm sorry. We didn't have your number or we would have called. That night, Kaylee's mother only shrugged and said, well, it was bound to occur. But what happened to the picture of her brother, and her violets? Her mother said, I imagine they got tossed out. Kaylee waited long enough so that her mother would not think she wanted to get away from her, but after some time passed Kaylee said, Mom, I want to go for a bike ride. The evenings are light now, and her mother looked at her suspiciously. Kaylee could not ride fast enough, up Dyer Road, then down Elm Street, and then up past the school, she just could not ride her bike fast enough. When Mr. Ringrose showed up the next week, silently as always, Kaylee was dusting the legs of the couch. She turned, she was enormously glad to see him. Hello, she whispered as she stood up. It was the first time she had spoken to him. He nodded and gave her a tiny smile, gazing at her through his rimless glasses. She unbuttoned her shirt without pause. She thought his eyes seemed even kinder than usual and she watched him steadily as she moistened her fingers and touched her breasts, the tips becoming hard almost instantly, if Mrs. Ringrose should walk in, she didn't care. This is how Kaylee felt that day as she turned slightly one way, then the other, for the silent Mr. Ringrose. She put the envelope of money inside her underwear drawer, and the next three weeks she did the same, she was astonished that one week there was a hundred dollar bill. School was now out, and on Wednesday mornings and Saturday mornings, Kaylee worked at the donut shop. She poured coffee and brought out the donuts from the back, slipping them into the white paper bags for the customers. One Wednesday she saw Mr. Ringrose walking by the place, he was glancing down at the sidewalk and did not look up through the window. He was slightly bent over, and she almost did not recognize him at first, his white hair was sticking at odd angles from his head. She stopped in the middle of an order to watch him, he seemed to not walk in a straight line. It could not be him, she decided. But she was rattled. No, that could not have been him. When she cleaned the Ringrose house the next week, he did not show up, and she felt terribly sad and worried. That Saturday, as the sun was slicing through the large glass windows of the donut shop, Mrs. Kitteridge walked in. Oh, Mrs. Kitteridge, Kaylee said, she was surprised at how glad she was to see her. But Mrs. Kitteridge looked at her and said, do I know you? And Kaylee blushed. I'm the Callahan. Oh, wait. Of course. I remember you, riding your bicycle to that awful nursing home to visit that woman. Kaylee said, do you still visit your friend there? My friend died. Mrs. Kitteridge looked her up and down. I'm sorry about that, she said. Then she added, well, not that she's dead, who wouldn't want to be dead living in there? Damn smart of her to die. My friend is still alive. Oh, I'm sorry, Kaylee said. Mrs. Kitteridge ordered three plain donuts and two cups of coffee, and she turned to the man behind her. Jack, she said, say hello to the Callahan girl. The man stepped forward, he was a big person as well, wearing aviator sunglasses and a short-sleeved shirt that showed his saggy arms, and Kaylee did not really like the way he said hello, Callahan girl as though he was slightly mocking her. By now, Mrs. Kitteridge said, and they walked out, Mrs. Kitteridge waving a hand above her head. A few evenings later, 
The telephone rang in their apartment, and Kaylee's mother answered and said, Yes, of course. Here she is. Kaylee had been playing the piano ferociously she had been playing it, but she had stopped when the telephone rang and now, when her mother said it's for you, Kaylee rose and went to the phone. Kaylee? This is Mrs. Ringrose. Kaylee opened her mouth but no sound came out. I won't be needing you anymore, said Mrs. Ringrose. There was a silence after that. Oh, I Kaylee started to say. There are a few health issues in our house, and I've retired, as I'm sure you know. So I can take care of things. Thank you, Kaylee. Goodbye. A wave of grief scooped Kaylee up, and it would not let her go. She rode her bicycle through town, down along the coast, she rode and rode, thinking of Mr. Ringrose. There was no one she could tell about what had happened, and this knowledge stayed in her and made her feel almost constantly unwell. But she simply kept going, riding her bicycle, working at the donut shop two mornings a week, and the man who ran the place let her add another morning, Thursdays. But she was a devastated girl, and one afternoon as she knelt on Bertha Babcock's kitchen floor with the toothbrush, she felt a real dizziness. Bertha Babcock was not home, and Kaylee stood up and she left the woman a note. I can't work here anymore. She did not even empty the pail of water, and she left the toothbrush on the floor. The next day, her mother came into the donut shop and said to Kaylee, you come straight home after work. Her mother looked awful, furious and small-eyed. When Kaylee got home, her mother was standing in her room. Kaylee's underwear and socks had been flung onto her bed, the bureau drawer stuck open like a tongue. Where did you get this money? Her mother screamed the words at her, and showed her the envelopes with the $20 bills and the one envelope with the $100 bill. Her mother took the money out and let it fly around the room as she tossed it in the air. Tell me where you got this. It's my house cleaning money, Kaylee said. No it is not. You got $10 to clean house for that Ringrose woman, and there's at least $300 here, where did it come from? Mom, I've been cleaning for her for ages. Don't you lie to me. Her mother's fury was huge, billowing through the room. Kaylee's mind worked quickly, she did the math even as her mother screamed, the other stuffed envelopes of cash were hidden in her closet, and she did not let her eyes look in that direction. Instead, she sat down on the bed and said, making her voice sound calm, it's my house cleaning money, mom. From Bertha Babcock, who pays me $15, so that's $25 a week. She added, and I went to the bank to get a $100 bill so I could have it. You're lying, her mother said. Bertha Babcock called here this morning and told me you just walked out. Kaylee did not answer this. Who taught you that you could just walk out of a job like that? Who taught you such a thing? Kaylee watched as her mother screamed and screamed at her. And then a funny thing happened to Kaylee. She stopped caring. Like a switch had gone off inside her. All the fear that had been escalating in her disappeared. She was done, she did not care. Her mother even slapped her across the face, which caused tears to spring to Kaylee's eyes, but she did not care. It was the strangest feeling she had ever had, and the feeling not her mother frightened her. Her silence seemed to cause her mother's wrath to increase I'm calling your sister, her mother yelled and when it was done, when her mother had left Kaylee's bedroom, Kaylee looked around and thought the room seemed vandalized, a pair of her underpants had landed on a lamp that had been overturned on her small desk, socks were against the far wall, her pink quilt had been ripped. When Brenda came over she said, just leave us for a bit. Mom. Sitting beside Kaylee on her bed, Brenda said, Oh, honey, what has happened? Kaylee looked at her, she wanted to cry now, yet she did not let herself. Honey, said Brenda, taking Kaylee's hand and stroking it, Honey, just tell me where you got the money, that's all, honey. Just tell me. If you added it up, you'd see it was my house cleaning money. And also from the donut shop. Brenda nodded. Okay, I thought so. 
Mom just got really, really furious because you'd quit Bertha Babcock and not told her. Mom's having a hard time, and she saw all this cash and thought maybe there were drugs involved or something. Oh, please, said Kaylee, and Brenda nodded understandingly, stroking Kaylee's arm now, and said, Oh, honey, I knew it wasn't drugs. After a few moments Kaylee said, I kind of hate living here with her. She hardly talks to me. And then it hurts my feelings. Oh, honey, said Brenda. Now listen, honey. Mom's gotten super depressed since dad died. And she was really too old to have had you Brenda leaned in and said, but thank God she did. Kaylee looked at her sister, the dark patches beneath her eyes, she suddenly remembered how Brenda had said, he wants it all the time, and it's kind of making me sick. Brenda, I love you, Kaylee said quietly. And we all love you. Now listen to me, honey. Brenda waited and said, as though it were a secret, honey, you're smart. You know that, right? The rest of us are more like mom, and she put her finger to her lips as though to indicate this should be kept secret. But you're like dad. You're smart. So, Kaylee, honey, just keep on doing well in school and you will have a future. A real future. What do you mean, a real future? I mean, you could be a doctor or nurse, or someone important, Kaylee. Seriously. Seriously, Brenda said. The next day, after her mother left for work, Kaylee took the many envelopes of cash from her closet, and as she walked around looking for a place to hide them, she suddenly thought of the piano. She opened the top of it, and slipped them in, and watched them fall down to the bottom behind the wires. She had no idea how she would ever get them out, but they were safe there, she had stopped playing the piano. She now expected nothing from her mother. And so when her mother was suddenly pleasant to her on certain evenings, Kaylee was surprised and she was pleasant in return. She talked to her mother about Miss Minnie one night, and her mother listened. Her mother spoke of the different patients that came into the dental office where she worked, and Kaylee listened. It was a doable existence. And this is why one Saturday when Kaylee came back from the donut shop and stepped into the living room and saw like a person's front tooth missing the absence where the piano had been, she felt gutted, almost as though it was not real. I sold it, her mother said. You never play it anymore, so I sold it to a Grange Hall near Portland. Kaylee waited, but no phone call ever came about the money. On one of the last days of summer, Mrs. Kitteridge came back into the donut shop. She was alone this time, and no one else was there at the moment. Hello, child, she said, and Kaylee said, Hello, Mrs. Kitteridge. You still working for that ring rose bat? Mrs. Kitteridge asked, she had just ordered two plain donuts. And Kaylee said, slipping the donuts into a white bag, No, she fired me. She fired you? Mrs. Kitteridge's face showed surprise. Then she said, what did you do, play with her little Mayflower boat? No. She just called me and said I wasn't needed anymore. And that there was illness in her house or something. Ha! Huh. Mrs. Kitteridge seemed to be considering something. Well, her husband's not well. Kaylee felt an odd tingling on the tip of her nose. Is he going to die, she asked. Mrs. Kitteridge shook her head. Worse than that, she said. Then she said, leaning forward, raising her hand to her cheek, her husband's going dope a dope. Mr. Ringrose. He is? That's what I heard. He was seen out back watering their tulip bed naked. And the tulips are long gone by. Kaylee looked at Mrs. Kitteridge. Are you kidding me? Mrs. Kitteridge sighed. Oh, it gets even worse. I've told you that much, I might as well tell you the rest. She's putting him in that nursing home where Miss Minnie was. Can you imagine that? They have to have more money than that. She could afford to put him in the Golden Bridge place, but she's sticking him out there, 
And I say and I have always said this Mrs. Kitteridge wrapped her hand on the counter twice. That woman was never nice to him. Not one bit. Mrs. Kitteridge gave a severe nod to Kaylee. Oh, said Kaylee, taking this in. Oh, that's so, so sad. And Mrs. Kitteridge said, I guess to God it is. In two days, Kaylee would start high school. The high school was a mile out of town, and her mother would drive her there in the morning, and she would walk back, or maybe a friend would drive her. But it was not near her old house on Maple Avenue, and today she rode her bicycle by that house, and she saw how the renovation had changed it. They had painted it a deep blue, when it had always been a white house, and there were pots of flowers on the newly made front stoop. The back room where her father had died had been removed altogether, and a large porch was there instead. After she rode by it she suddenly turned at the corner and rode her bicycle out over the bridge past the mill to the old nursing home where Miss Minnie had been. She stayed on the other side of the street when she got to the place, and dismounted from her bicycle and looked at the building, it was dark green, a shingled building, and it seemed smaller than it had before. She walked her bike along the side of the road, a few cars whizzed past. She waited for the cars to go by then crossed the street and walked her bicycle around to the back, where the employees parked. And then, not wanting to be seen by anyone, she went to the side of the building that faced the woods, and she sat down on the gravel there, her bicycle leaning against the wall of the place. The very top of a tree had started to turn red, and Kaylee looked up at it, then looked at the gravel glinting in the sun. She thought about Mrs. Ring Rose, how she had started the silver squares, and had that fashion show, beginning with the pilgrims. Oh my god, Kaylee thought, leaning her head against the shingled wall and closing her eyes. And her Mayflower boat in her living room. It seemed to Kaylee that the history this woman had clung to was no longer important, it would be almost washed away, just a dot left not just by the Irish, but by so many things that had happened since, the civil rights movement, the fact that the world was much smaller now people connected in new ways Mrs. Ringrose had never imagined. And then Kaylee thought about Mr. Ringrose, who, in a way, she had never stopped thinking about, the loneliness he must have endured, and was enduring still, now just a few feet away. Kaylee shook her head, and pulled her arms up to cover her face. At the moment only for this moment it was all she wanted, just to be near him again. Motherless child. They were late. Olive Kitteridge hated people who were late. A little after lunchtime, they had said, and Olive had the lunch things out, peanut butter and jelly for the two oldest kids, and tuna fish sandwiches for her son and his wife, Anne. About the little ones, she had no idea, the baby must not eat anything solid yet, only being six weeks old, little Henry was over two, but what did two-year-olds eat? Olive couldn't remember what Christopher ate when he was that age. She walked into the living room, looking at everything through the eyes of her son, he would have to realize as soon as he walked in. The phone rang, and Olive moved quickly back to the kitchen to answer it. Christopher said, OK, Mom, we're just leaving Portland, we had to stop for lunch. Lunch, said Olive. It was two o'clock in the afternoon. The late April sun was a milky sun, seen through the window over the bay, which shone with a steely lightness, no whitecaps today. We had to get something for the kids to eat. So we'll be there soon. Portland was an hour away. Olive said, OK, then. Will you still be needing supper? Supper, asked Christopher, as though she had proposed they take a shuttle to the moon. Sure, I guess so. In the background Olive heard a scream. Christopher said, Annabelle, shut up. Stop it right now. Annabelle, I'm counting to three, Mom, I'll have to call you back, and the phone went dead. Oh Godfrey, Olive murmured, sitting down at the kitchen table. She had still not taken the pictures from the wall, yet the place looked remarkably different, as though as was the case she would be moving out of it soon. She did not think of herself as a person who had knickknacks, but there was a box of stuff in the back corner of the kitchen, and as she glanced into the living room from where she sat, 
that room seemed to her to be even more guilty, there was only the furniture and the two paintings on the wall. The books were gone she had given them to the library a week ago and the lamps, except for one, were packed into a box as well. The phone rang again. Sorry about that, said her son. Are you supposed to be talking on a cell phone and driving? Olive asked. I'm not driving. Anne's driving. Anyway, we'll be there when we get there. All right then, Olive said. She added, I'll be awful glad to see you. Me too, said her son. Me too. Hanging up she walked through the house, and trepidation fluttered through her. You're doing this all wrong, she said quietly to herself. Oh Godfrey mighty, Olive. Almost three years it had been since she had seen her son. This did not seem natural or right to Olive. And yet when she had gone to visit him in New York City when and was pregnant with little Henry, and way before and had this other child, Natalie, a baby now the visit had gone so poorly that her son had essentially asked her to leave. And she had left. And she had seen him only once since, soon after, when he had flown to Maine for his father's funeral and spoken before the whole church, tears coming down his face. I never heard my father swear was one thing her son had said that day. Olive checked the bathroom, made sure there were clean towels, she knew there were clean towels, but she could not stop herself from checking again. They had said not to worry about not having a crib, but Olive did worry. Little Henry was two and a half years old, and Natalie was six weeks, how could they not have a crib? Well, judging by how she had seen them living in New York God, what a mess that house had been she decided they could make do with about anything. Annabelle was almost for now, Theodore was six. What did a six-year-old boy want to do? And why did they have so many children? Anne had had Theodore with one man, Annabelle with another, and now she had spit out two more babies with Christopher. What in God's name was that about? Christopher was not a young man. In fact, when Olive saw him stepping out of the car she could not believe she could not believe that he had grey in his hair now. Christopher. She walked toward him, but he was opening the doors of the car, and little children spilled out. Hi, Mom. He nodded at her. There was the little dark-haired girl, dressed in a bulky pink nylon coat, also wearing a pair of knee-high rubber boots, Robin's egg blue, who turned away immediately, and the blonde boy, older, who stared at Olive, and was taking her time getting the baby out of the car. Olive went to Christopher, her son, and she put her arms around him, and felt the awkwardness of his older man's body in her arms. She stepped back, and he stepped back, then he reached into the car and leaned over a child in an apparatus that looked like a small pilot seat for a child headed to outer space, he brought out the kid, and said to his mother, here's Henry. The child looked with large slumbering eyes at Olive, and he was placed, standing, on the ground, where he held on to his father's leg. Hello, Henry, Olive said, and the child's eyes rolled up slightly, then he pressed his face into his father's pant legs. Is he all right? Olive demanded, because the sight of him, dark-haired like his mother, dark-eyed as well, caused her to think immediately, this is not Henry Kitteridge. What had she thought? She had thought she would see her husband in the little boy, but instead she saw a stranger. He's just waking up. Christopher said, picking the child up. Well, come in, come in, Olive said, realizing then that she had not spoken yet to Anne, who held the baby patiently nearby. Hello there, Anne, Olive said, Anne and said, hello, Olive. Your boots are as blue as your hat, Olive said to the little girl, and the little girl looked puzzled and walked to her mother. It's an expression, Olive explained the child wore no hat and said, we got those boots for our trip to Maine, and this confused Olive. Well, take them off before you come inside, Olive said. In New York, Anne had asked if she could call Olive mom. Now Anne did not move toward Olive, and so Olive did not walk toward Anne, but turned and walked into the house instead. Three nights they were to stay. Once in the kitchen, Olive watched her son carefully. 
His face at first seemed open, pleased as he looked around. Jesus, Mom, you've really cleaned up. Wow. Then she saw the shadow come. Wait, have you given away everything of Dad's? What's the story? No, of course I haven't. Then she said, well, sure, some of it. He's been gone a while, Chris. He looked at her. What? She repeated what she had said, but she turned away as she said it. Then she said, Theodore, would you like a drink of water? The boy stared at her with huge eyes. Then he shook his head slightly and walked over to his mother, who, even as she was holding the baby, was shrugging her way out of a bulky black sweater. Olive could see that and stomach bulged through her black stretch pants, although her arms seemed skinny in a white nylon blouse. And sat down at the kitchen table and said, I'd like a glass of water, Olive, and when Olive turned around to hand it to her, she saw a breast just sticking out in plain view, right there in the kitchen, the nipple large and dark and Olive felt a tiny bit ill. And pressed the baby to her, and Olive saw the little thing, eyes closed, clasp onto the nipple and smiled up at Olive, but Olive thought it was not a real smile. Phew, and said. Christopher said nothing more about his father's possessions, and Olive took that as a good sign. Christopher, she said. Make yourself at home. Then a look passed over her son's face that let her know this was not his home anymore this is what Olive thought she saw on his face but he sat down at the kitchen table, his long legs stretched out. What would you like? Olive asked him. What do you mean, what would I like? Christopher looked up at the clock, then back at her. I mean, would you also like a glass of water? I'd like a drink. Okay, a drink of what? A drink drink, but I don't imagine you have anything like that. I do, Olive said. She opened the refrigerator. I have some white wine. Would you like some white wine? You have wine? Christopher asked. Yes, I would love some white wine, thank you, Mom. He stood. Wait, I'll get it. And he took the wine bottle, which was half full, and poured the wine into a tumbler as though it was lemonade. Thank you. He raised the glass and drank from it. When did you start drinking wine? Oh Olive stopped herself from saying Jack's name. I just started to drink a little, that's all. Christopher's grin was sardonic. No, you didn't, Mom. Tell me the truth when did you start drinking wine? He sat back down at the table. Sometimes I'll have friends over, and they drink it. Olive had to turn away, she opened a cupboard and brought out a box of saltine crackers. Have a cracker. I even have some cheese. You have friends over. But Christopher didn't seem to require an answer, and he sat at the table with his wife, who finally stuck her breast back inside her shirt, and Christopher ate all the cheese and most of the crackers, and then sipped at his wine, which he drank quickly. More? He pushed the glass forward, and Olive, who thought he'd had enough wine, said, okay, then, and gave him the wine bottle, which he emptied into his glass. Olive needed to sit down. She realized there were only two chairs at the table, how had she not realized that before? She said, let's go into the living room. But they did not get up, and so she stood at the counter, feeling shaky. Tell me about the drive up, she said. Long, Christopher said, his mouth full of cracker, and and said, longitude. Neither of Anne's children spoke a word to Olive. Not a word. Not a thank you or a please not one word did they say. They watched her carefully, then turned away. She thought they were horrible children. She said, here's a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, pointing to the ones that sat on the counter, and they said nothing. All right, fine, she said. But little Henry was a sweet thing in his way. In the living room where they finally went, because Olive said again, Let's go into the living room he toddled over to her and pulled his wet hand from his mouth and put it on Olive's leg where she sat on the couch, and he banged her knee a few times, and she said, Hello, Henry. The child said, 
hi. Hello, she said again, and he said, hi, hi. Well, that was fun. But when Olive only because she felt it was expected of her asked to hold the baby, Natalie, the baby screamed her head off as soon as she was in Olive's arms. Just screamed her little head off. Okay then, all right then, Olive said, and handed her back to her mother, who took some time getting the baby calmed down. And had to pull out her breast again to do this, and Olive was pretty sick of seeing her daughter-in-law's breast, it was so naked, the breast. All huge with milk and a few veins running over it, honestly, Olive did not care to see it anymore. She stood up and said, I'll get supper started. Christopher said, oh, I don't think we're hungry yet. No problem, Olive called over her shoulder. In the kitchen she lit the oven and put the casserole in that she had made earlier that morning, scallops and sour cream. Then she returned to the living room. Olive had expected chaos. She had not expected the silence of these children, or even the silence of Anne, who was different than Olive remembered. I'm tired, and said to her at one point, and Olive said, I should think so. So maybe that was it. Christopher was more talkative. Sprawled on the couch in the living room, he spoke of the traffic they had run into outside of Worcester, he spoke of their Christmas, their friends, his job as a podiatrist. She wanted to hear it all. But Anne interrupted and said, Olive, where did you put your Christmas tree? By the front window. I didn't have a Christmas tree, Olive said. She said, why in the world would I have a Christmas tree? And raised her eyebrows. Because it was Christmas. Olive didn't care for that. Not in this house it wasn't, she said. After Anne had taken the older children into the study, where the couch had been turned into a bed, Olive sat with Christopher and little Henry, who dangled from his father's lap. Cute kid, Olive said, and Christopher said, he really is, right? From the study she could hear and murmuring, and she could hear the higher-pitched voices but not the words of the children. Olive stood up and said, oh, Christopher, I knit little Henry a scarf. She went into the study the two older kids in there just stood silently and watched her and got the scarf she had knit, bright red, and brought it out, and she gave it to Christopher, who said, Hey, Henry, look what your grandmother made for you, and the little boy put part of it into his mouth. Silly thing, Christopher said to him, and pulled it gently. You wear it to keep warm. And the child clapped his hands. Olive thought he was really a fairly amazing child. Anne appeared in the doorway, flanked with her two kids, who were now in their pyjamas. She said, um, Olive. She passed her lips a moment and then said, do you have anything for the other children? Olive felt the swiftness of dark rising up through her. It took her a moment to trust herself, then she said, I don't know what you mean, Anne. Are you talking about Christmas presents? I sent the children Christmas presents. Yeah? and said slowly. But that was, you know, Christmas. Olive said, well, I never heard a word from you, so perhaps they didn't get them. No, we got them, and said. Then she said to Theodore, remember that truck. The child shrugged one arm and turned away. And yet they stood there, that beastly mother and her two children from two different men, stood right there in the doorway as though Olive was supposed to produce what was she supposed to produce. She really had to bite her tongue not to say, I guess you didn't like that truck. Or to say to the little girl, and what about that doll? I suppose you didn't like that either. Olive had to force. Herself not to say, in my day we thanked people who sent us gifts. No, Olive really had to work not to say this, but she did not say this, and after a few minutes and said to the kids, come on, let's get you to bed. Give daddy a kiss. And they walked to Christopher and kissed him, then walked right by Olive and that was that. Horrible, horrible children, and a horrible mother. But little Henry suddenly wiggled out of his father's lap and dragged his new scarf across the floor to Olive. Hi, he said. He smiled at her. Hello, she said. Hello, little Henry. 
Hi, hi, he said. He held the scarf toward Olive. Gank you, he said. Well, he was a kitteridge. He was surely a kitteridge all right. Oh, your grandfather would have been so proud, she said to him, and he smiled and smiled, his teeth wet with saliva. Christopher was looking around the room. Mom, this place looks awfully different, he said. You haven't been here in a while, Olive said. Things change and your memory is different too. Olive was happy. Her son was talking to her alone. Little Henry had been put to bed upstairs, and his mother and his tiny baby sister were up there as well. The two older children were tucked into their couch bed in the study. The light from the lamp in the corner spilled over her son. This was all she wanted, just this. Chris's eyes seemed clear, his face seemed clear. The grey in his hair still surprised her, but she thought he looked good. He spoke a great deal about his podiatry practice, the young woman who worked for him, the insurance he had to pay, the insurance that his patients had, Olive didn't care what he talked about. He talked about their tenant, no longer the guy with the parrot that would screech praise God. Anytime someone swore, but a young man with a girlfriend now, they were probably going to get married soon. On and on he talked, her son. Olive was tired, but she stifled a yawn. She would stay here forever to hear this. He could recite the alphabet to her and she would sit here and listen to it. When he finally went to bed okay, night, mom, raising a hand she sat for a while in the living room, with just the one lamp on, the water seen through the window all black, just the tiny speck of the red light out at halfway rock, the front deck with its wooden chairs that she had brought out only recently seemed to sit quietly and patiently in the dark. It was the first night she had not spoken to Jack in months and she missed that, but he seemed far away to her right now. And then there was a sudden shriek mama, from the study. Olive's heart started to beat fast, and she got up as quickly as she could and went to the door of the study, where Annabelle stood. Annabelle looked at her, then stepped back and screamed again, Mama. Now stop that, Olive said. Your mother is exhausted. Let her sleep. And the little girl pushed the door shut. Olive waited for a moment, then she went upstairs to bed. But she heard the child most likely it was Annabelle on the stairs later, and heard her go into her parents' room, and Olive thought, honest to God, what a brat. She heard Anne's tired voice murmuring, but Olive was on her computer, and there was an email from Jack, how's it going? I miss you, Olive. Please, please write me when you can. And she wrote back, oh, too much to say. I miss you too. A part of Olive thought, come on, Jack, I have my hands full here, I can't be there with you too. It was as though she had 500 bees buzzing in her head. Olive did not fall asleep for many hours that night, she kept going over her conversation with Chris like a giddy schoolgirl oh, she had missed him. And when she woke, she heard people in the kitchen. She got out of bed quickly, she was a very early riser, and she had not expected that Anne and Christopher and all their children would get out of bed earlier than she did. But they had. Every one of them was right there in the kitchen, fully dressed, when she went downstairs. Olive was not one to wear a bathrobe in front of people she felt she barely knew. Well, hello, she said, tugging her bathrobe tightly closed. And no one said anything. The older children looked at her with open hostility Olive felt this and even little Henry was silent, on his mother's lap. Christopher said, Mom, you didn't get Cheerios? I told you we needed Cheerios. You did? Olive could not remember her son mentioning Cheerios. Well, there's oatmeal, she said. She felt she saw Christopher and an exchanging a look. I'll go, and said. Just tell me how to get there. No, said Christopher, I'll go. You stay here. And then God, just in the nick of time Olive said, no, I'll go. Everyone just stay put. And so Olive went back upstairs and put some clothes on and then she took her coat and her big black handbag and she walked through the kitchen as fast as she could, 
and drove over to Cottles. The day was bright with Sunday. All she wanted was to speak to Jack. But she had walked out the door without her cell phone. And what had happened to pay phones? She felt hurried and upset, knowing the kids were home waiting for their Cheerios. Jack, Jack, she called out in her head. Help me, Jack, she called. What good was the fact that Jack had bought her a cell phone when she didn't even remember to take it with her? Finally, after she had the bag with the Cheerios in it, as she was pulling out of the parking lot, she saw a payphone near the back of the lot, and she parked again and walked quickly to it, and she couldn't find a quarter at first, but then she found a quarter and she slipped it into the phone and there was no dial tone. The goddamn phone did not work. Oh, she was fit to be tied. Olive had trouble driving home, she really had to concentrate. After she tossed the Cheerios in the paper bag onto the kitchen table, she said, if you'll excuse me just a moment, and she went upstairs to her room, and she emailed Jack with fingers that were almost trembling. Help me, she wrote, I don't know what to do. Then she realized that he couldn't help her, he couldn't call her they had agreed they would not speak by phone until Olive had told Chris and so she deleted what she had just written and wrote instead, it's okay, I just miss you. Hang in there. Then she added, more soon. Back down in the kitchen the silence remained. What's the matter? Olive asked, she heard the anger in her voice. There's not much milk, mom. There was only a little. So Annabelle got it, and Theodore has to have his Cheerios plain. Christopher was leaning against the counter as he said this, one ankle crossed over the other. Are you serious? Olive asked. Well, I'll go back. No, just sit, mom. Christopher nodded at the chair that Theodore sat in. It's okay. Theodore, give your grandmother a chair. The child, with his eyes down, slid off the chair and stood. Anne's back was to her, and Olive could see little Henry on one of Anne's knees, and was holding the baby too. What about the rest of you? Olive asked. What can I get for you? How about some toast? It's okay, Mom, Christopher said again. I'll make some toast. You sit, Mom. So she sat at the table across from her daughter-in-law, who turned and smiled her phony smile at Olive. Theodore moved to his mother and whispered something into her ear. And rubbed his arm and said quietly, I know, honey. But people live differently. Christopher said, what's up, Theodore? Annan said, he was just commenting on the paper bag the Cheerios came in, wondering why Olive didn't use a recycling bag. She looked at Olive and shrugged a shoulder. In New York, we recycle. We bring our own bags to the store. Is that right? Olive said. Well, good for you. She turned around and opened the bottom cupboard and just about flung the recycling grocery bag onto the table. If I hadn't been in such a hurry I would have used this. Oh, said and look at that, Theodore. And the child moved away from the table, then he turned and went into the study. And was handing little Henry a cheerio. Little Henry did not seem in such a good mood this morning. Hello, little Henry, Olive said, and he did not look at her, just looked for a long moment at the cheerio in his hand before putting it into his mouth. The day was very sunny and bright, all the clouds from yesterday had gone, and the sun shone through the house. Outside through the big living room windows the bay was brilliant, and the lobster boys bobbed just slightly, a lobster boat was headed out, the trees across the bay were a fine line. It was decided they would all drive out to Reed State Park to watch the surf. The kids have never really seen the ocean, said Christopher. The real ocean. They've seen the crappy stuff that floats up to New York. I'd like them to see the main coast. I know we've got it right here he nodded toward the window where the bay was sparkling but I'd like them to see more of it. Well, let's go then, Olive said. We'll have to take two cars, Christopher said. So we'll take two cars. Olive stood up and scraped the uneaten toast left by Theodore into the garbage. 
In her whole life, Olive would not have allowed Christopher to waste toast like this, but what did she care? Let that beastly child waste all the food he wanted. Once outside, Olive was surprised by Christopher saying, Mom, when did you get a Subaru? He didn't say it pleasantly, is what she felt. She had put the car in the garage the day before, it was only out now because of her trip to the store. Oh, she said, I had to get a new car, and I thought, I'm an old lady on my own, I'll get a good car for the snow. She could not believe she said that. It was a lie. She had just lied to her son. The truth was, the car belonged to Jack. When her Honda had needed new brake pads, Jack had said, take my Subaru, Olive. We're two people with three cars, and that's ridiculous, so take the Subaru, and we'll keep my sports car because I love it. I can't believe you got a Subaru, her son said again, and Olive said, well, I did. And that's that. The time it took to get things arranged, Olive could not believe. Christopher and Anne had to go over to the side of the parking area and have a conversation, Olive took out her sunglasses and put them on. When Christopher returned he said, Theodore, you're going with your mother, and, Henry, we're putting your car seat in your grandmother's car. So Olive waited, chilly in her coat even though the sun was bright, while Christopher got the car seat and put it into her car and she heard him swearing that the seat belt wasn't working, and she said, it's a used car, Chris, and he stuck his head out of it finally and said, okay, we're all set. You drive, she said, and he did. And sat on a rock that looked out at the ocean, even though the rock must have been very cold it was windswept and had no moisture on it, but it still must have been cold while Christopher ran back and forth on the beach with the kids. Olive watched this from the edge of the parking lot, her coat pulled tight around her. After a few minutes she made her way to Anne, who looked up at her, the baby asleep in her arms. Hello, Olive, Anne said. Olive couldn't figure out what to do. The rocks were wide, but she couldn't get herself down to a sitting position. So she stood. Finally she said, how's your mother, Anne? and said something that got lost in the wind. What? Olive said. I said she's dead. And turned her head back to Olive, yelling this. She died? Olive yelled this back. When did she die? A couple months ago, and yelled in the wind toward Olive. For a number of moments Olive stood there. She had no idea what to do. But then she decided she would try and sit next to Anne, and so she bent down and placed her hands carefully on the rock and finally got herself seated. Olive said, so she died right before you had Natalie. Anne nodded. Olive said, what a hell of a thing. Thank you, said Anne. And Olive realized that this girl, this tall, strange girl who was a middle-aged woman was grieving. Did she die suddenly? Olive asked. And squinted toward the water. I guess. Except she never took care of herself, you know. So it shouldn't have been a surprise when she had her heart attack. And waited a moment, then turned her face toward Olive. Except I was surprised. I'm still surprised. Olive nodded. Yeah, of course you are. After a moment Olive added, it's always a surprise, I think. Even if they're languishing for months, they still just go away. Horrible business. And said, do you remember that song, I think it's a black spiritual sometimes I feel like a motherless child. A long way from home, Olive finished. Yeah, that one, and said. Then and said, but I always felt that way. And now I am. Olive considered this. Well, I'm very sorry, she said. Then she asked, where was she living when she died? Outside of Cincinnati, where she always lived. Where I grew up, you know. Olive nodded. From the corner of her eye she watched this girl this woman and she thought, who are you, Anne? She knew the girl had a brother somewhere, but what was his story? She couldn't remember 
she only knew they had no contact, was he on drugs? He might have been. The mother had been a drinker, Olive knew that. And her father had divorced the mother years ago, he'd been dead for a long time. She said again, well, awful sorry. Thanks. And stood up remarkably easily, considering she was holding the baby and then she walked away. She just walked away. It took Olive many moments to stand up, she had to heave herself onto one arm and roll herself a bit to get her foot under her. Oh, honest to God, she said. She was panting by the time she got back to the car. On the way back, Olive said, Chris, why didn't you tell me Anne's mother died? He made a sound and shrugged. But why wouldn't you tell me such a thing? Through the window were the trees still bare, their limbs dark, poking toward the sky. They passed by a field that looked soggy and matted down in parts, the streaming sun showing it all. Oh, her mother was nuts. Whatever. In the back seat, Henry sang out, Goggy, Goggy. Train, airplane. Daddy, Mama. Olive turned to look at him, and he smiled at her. He's just singing all the words he knows, Christopher said. He likes to do that. But I don't understand, Olive said, after waving to little Henry. I just don't, Christopher. She's my daughter-in-law, and I'd like to know what's going on in her life. Christopher glanced at her quickly, then back at the road, he drove with one arm draped across the wheel. I really didn't know you cared, he said. He looked over at her again. What? he asked. Olive had started to ask a question. Why? I just told you why. And Olive nodded. Her question, which she did not ask, was, why did you marry this woman? They made it through another night, and one more day, and then the final night arrived. Olive was exhausted. In the entire time, except for little Henry, the children did not speak to her. But they stared at her with increasing boldness, she thought because whenever she looked at them they were looking at her, and instead of glancing down as they had at first they continued to stare, Theodore with his huge blue eyes, and Annabelle with her small dark ones. Unbelievable children. Finally they went off to bed in the study and Olive sat with Christopher and Anne and the baby while little Henry such a good boy was asleep upstairs. Olive was getting used to the breast being stuck out in the open now, she didn't like it, but she was getting used to it. And she felt sorry for Anne, who seemed to her to be diminished in her grief. So she made small talk with the woman and Anne seemed to try to do her best as well. And said, Annabelle wanted those rubber boots because we were going to Maine. Isn't that sweet? And Olive, who could not think what to say about this, nodded. And eventually went upstairs with the baby, and then Olive was alone with Christopher, and she realized the moment had come. Christopher. She forced herself to look at him, although he was looking down at his foot. I'm getting married. It seemed forever before he looked at her and said, with half a smile, wait. What did you just say? I said I'm getting married. To Jack Kennison. She saw the color leave his face, without a doubt his face became pale. He looked around the room for a moment, then turned to look at her. Who the fuck is Jack Kennison? He lost his wife a while ago. I've mentioned him on the phone to you, Chris. She felt as though her face was flaming hot, as though all the blood that had drained from her son's face had made its way to her face instead. He looked at her with such genuine astonishment, she felt she would take it back immediately, the whole thing, if she could. You're getting married. His voice was quiet now. In a quieter voice he said, Mommy. You're getting married. Olive nodded quickly. I am, Chris. He kept shaking his head in small gestures, slowly, just kept shaking it and shaking it. I don't understand. I don't get this, Mom. Why are you getting married? Because we're two lonely old people and we want to be together. Then be together. But why get married? Mom. 
Chris, what difference does it make? He leaned forward and said his voice sounded almost menacing if it doesn't make any difference, then why are you doing it? I meant, to you. What difference does it make to you? But horribly, Olive now felt a niggling of doubt. Why was she marrying Jack? What difference did it make? Christopher said, Mom, you invited us up here just to tell us that, didn't you? I can't believe it. I invited you up here because I wanted to see you. I haven't seen you since your father's funeral. Christopher was looking at her hard. You invited us up here to tell us you were getting married. Unfucking believable. Then he said, Mon, you have never invited us up here. I didn't need to invite you, Chris. You're my son. This is your home. And then the color returned to his face. This is not my home, he said, looking around. Oh my god. He shook his head slowly. Oh my god. He stood up. That's why it looks so different. You're moving out. Are you going to move into his house? Of course you are. And sell this one? Oh my god, mom. He turned to look at her. When are you getting married? Soon, she said. Is there going to be a wedding? No wedding she said. We'll go to town hall. He walked to the stairs. Good night, he said. Chris. He turned. Olive stood up. Your language is deplorable. You said at your father's funeral that the man never swore. Christopher stared at her. Mom, you're killing me, he said. Well, Jack is coming over in the morning to meet you before you all leave. She was suddenly furious. Good night, she said. She could hear almost immediately Christopher and Anne talking, she could not hear what they said, she was sitting in the living room, but the sound of their voices came to her steadily. Finally she rose and slowly, very quietly, went and stood by the stairs. Always been a narcissist, Chris, you know that. And then Chris answered, but Jesus Christ, and something more, and Olive turned and went just as slowly and quietly back to her chair in the living room. In her room later that night she kept thinking about the word narcissist, which she knew the meaning of naturally, but did she really know the meaning? She looked at her computer, finding the word narcissism in the dictionary. Self-admiration, it said, then, personality disorder. She closed the computer. Olive didn't understand this, she really didn't. Self-admiration. Olive felt no admiration of herself. Personality disorder. Given the extensive and widespread array of human emotions, why was anything a personality disorder? And who came up with such a term? People like that crackpot therapist and and Christopher had been seeing years ago in New York. Well, that therapist had a disorder, he was crazy. She got into bed and she did not expect to sleep, and she did not sleep. She took from her bedside drawer the little transistor radio she had held on to while she slept or tried to for so many nights of her later life, and she turned it on low and held it to her ear, lying with it that way. The entire night went by and she stared at the dark, turning only a few times. She watched the red digital clock, and she clung to her little transistor radio but she heard every word that came from it and understood that she had not even dozed. When it was light she got up and got dressed and went downstairs. She put three bowls of Cheerios and the milk on the table. Glancing in the small mirror by the doorway she saw that she had the red and eye look of a prisoner. Hi, Mom, said Christopher, appearing in the kitchen. What time is he coming over? Because we have a long drive. I'll call him right now said Olive, and she did. Hello, Jack, she said, can you come over now? They have a long drive and want to get started. Wonderful. See you soon. She hung up. Oh, kids, look what grandma did. And came in holding the baby. She got your cereal out. The children did not look at her Olive noticed but sat down, 
Theodore and Annabelle balanced together on one chair, and ate their cereal. They made terrible smacking sounds. Little Henry put his spoon on the table and banged it hard, then smiled at Olive as milk and Cheerios sprayed through the air. Henry, murmured Anne. And Henry said, airplane. And took the spoon and rode it through the air. As soon as Olive saw Jack's car pulling into the driveway she realized that Jack of course was driving his sports car, and she hoped Christopher didn't see it. When Jack knocked on the door, and she let him in, she saw that he was wearing his suede coat, and she thought he looked rich, and sly. But he had the sense not to kiss her. Jack, she said. Hello. Come and meet my son. And his wife, she added. And then added, and their kids. Jack gave a small bow in his ironical way, his eyes twinkling as they often did, and he followed her into the living room. Hello, Christopher, he said, and he held out his hand. Christopher rose slowly from his chair and said, hello. He shook Jack's hand as though it was a dead fish he had been offered. Oh, come on now, Chris. The words were out of Olive's mouth before she realized what she had done. Christopher looked at her with open surprise. Come on. He said this loudly. Come on. Jesus, mon. What do you mean, oh, come on now, Chris? I just meant an Olive understood that she had been frightened of her son for years. Oh, stop it, Christopher. Stop it, for Christ's sake. This was Anne's voice, she had walked into the room after Olive, and Olive, turning toward her, was amazed to see that Anne's face was red, her lips seemed bigger, her eyes seemed bigger, and she said, again, stop it, Chris. Just stop it. Let the woman get married. What's the matter with you? Jesus. You can't even be polite to him. For crying out loud, Christopher, you are such a baby. You think I have four little kids. I have five little kids. Then Anne turned toward Jack and Olive and said, On behalf of my husband, I would like to apologize for his unbelievably childish behavior. He can be so childish, and this is childish, Christopher. Jesus Christ, is this childish of you? Almost immediately Christopher held up his hands and said, She's right, she's right, I am being childish, and I'm sorry. Jack, let's start again. How are you? And Christopher put his hand out once again toward Jack, and Jack shook it. But Christopher's face was as pale as paper and Olive felt in her utter bewilderment a terrible pity for him, her son, who had just been so openly yelled at by his wife. Jack waved a hand casually and said something about it being no problem, he was sure it was a shock, and he sat down and Christopher sat down and then left the room, and Olive stood there. She only barely heard as her son asked Jack who was still wearing his suede coat what he had done for work, and she only barely heard Jack say he had taught at Harvard his whole life his subject had been the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and Christopher nodded and said, cool, that's cool, and walked back and forth with the children's things, gathering up all their belongings, the children stood in the doorway watching, sometimes going to their mother, and she shook them off. Move, she yelled at one of them. Little Henry stood in the doorway of the living room and began to cry. Olive went to him. Now, now, she said. He ran his hand over his wet eyes and looked up at her. Then and Olive was never sure this really happened, for the rest of her life she didn't know if she imagined it he stuck his tongue out at her. Okay, said Olive, okay, then, and she moved back into the living room, where Jack and Christopher were now standing, finishing their talk. All set? Christopher asked Anna as she passed through the room once more with a wheelie suitcase. Then he turned to Jack. Very nice to have met you, if you'll excuse me, I have to help my wife get our brood together. Oh, of course. And Jack bowed again in his ironical way. He stepped back and put his hands into the pockets of his khaki pants, and then he took them out again. Olive was dazed as they got all their things together, their coats on, the shoes, the blue rubber boots, Anne's expression remained stony, and Christopher was obsequious in his attempts to be helpful to her. 
Finally they were ready to leave, and Olive put her own coat on so she could walk them to the car. Jack walked them out as well, and Olive saw her son speak to Jack once more by the passenger side and was to drive and her son seemed open-faced, and even had a smile as he spoke to Jack. The kids were all buckled in, and then Chris walked to Olive and gave her a half-hug, almost not touching her, and said, bye, mom, and Olive said, goodbye, Chris, and then and gave her a hug too, not much of one, and and said, thanks, Olive. And then they drove away. It wasn't until Olive saw the red scarf that she had knit for little Henry lying half under the couch in the living room that she felt something close to terror. She bent down and picked it up, and she took the scarf and returned to the kitchen, where Jack was leaning forward with his arms on the tabletop. Olive opened the door and put the scarf into the garbage bin by the front door. Then she came back inside and sat down across from Jack. Well, she said. Well, Jack said. He said it kindly. He placed his large, age-spotted hand over Olive's own. In a moment he added, I guess we know who wears the pants in that family. Her mother died recently, Olive said. She's grieving. But she pulled her hand away. It came to her then with a horrible whoosh of the crescendo of truth, she had failed on a colossal level. She must have been failing for years and not realized it. She did not have a family as other people did. Other people had their children come and stay and they talked and laughed and the grandchildren sat on the laps of their grandmothers, and they went places and did things, ate meals together, kissed when they parted. Olive had images of this happening in many homes, her friend Edith, for example, before she had moved to that place for old people, her kids would come and stay. Surely they had a better time than what had just happened here. And it had not happened out of the blue. She could not understand what it was about her, but it was about her that had caused this to happen. And it had to have been there for years, maybe all of her life, how would she know? As she sat across from Jack stunned she felt as though she had lived her life as though blind. Jack? Yes, Olive. She shook her head. What she would not tell Jack was the alarm she had felt when she saw and yell at her son, and what came to her as she sat here now was the fact that it had not been the first time and had yelled at him like that, these were openings into the darkness of a relationship one saw by mistake, as if inside a dark barn, the door had been momentarily blown off and one saw things not meant to be seen. But it was more than that. She had done what and had done. She had yelled at Henry in front of people. She could not remember who, exactly, but she had always been fierce when she felt like it. So there was this, her son had married his mother, as all men in some form or other eventually do. Jack spoke quietly. Hey, Olive. Let's get you out of here for a while. Let's take a drive, then come to my place. You need a break from being here. Good idea. Olive stood and went and got her coat and her big black handbag and she let Jack walk her out to the Subaru. He helped her in, and then got in himself, and they drove away. Olive almost looked back behind her, but she closed her eyes instead, she could see it perfectly anyway. Her house, the house she and Henry had built so many years ago, the house that looked small now and would be razed to the ground by whoever bought it, the property was what mattered. But she saw behind her closed eyes the house and inside her was a shiver that went through her bones. The house where she had raised her son never, ever realizing that she herself had been raising a motherless child, now a long, long way from home. Helped. It was not until the Larkin house burned to the ground that people found out Louise Larkin was not living there anymore. The newspaper said she was in the Golden Bridge rest home. That means she's gone completely dopey dope Olive Kitteridge said to Jack Kennison as she looked up from the paper. But my word, what a sad thing about her husband. Louise Larkin's husband had died in the fire, apparently he had lived only in the upstairs of the house, and the fire had started in the kitchen. It was drug-related, according to the newspaper that Olive was reading. The headline said, 83-year-old man dies in house fire, drug users suspected. The next day's newspaper confirmed the part about the drug users. An arrest had been made. 
Two people who were drug addicts, and who had assumed the place was vacant, had broken into the house to steal things to steal copper and then the fire had started as a result of their cooking meth. They had both made it out of the burning house, but by the time the fire was reported, at four in the morning, there was not much the firemen could do. The place was big, but it was wooden and old, and it went like kindling. Now it sat, the charred remains, right there as you drove into the town of Crosby, Maine, and it was really a sad thing to look at. It was autumn and the leaves had changed but were not yet falling, and the maples by the Larkin home screamed out their beautiful colours, but to be honest the place had been sad to look at for a while even before it burned almost to the ground. The grass had grown knee-high, and the bushes were no longer trimmed, covering the large, majestic windows in the front. It was no surprise that people were surprised to hear that Roger Larkin had been living upstairs there all along. But what a terrible way to die. Burned to death while two drug addicts cooked their awful stuff right below you. There was a lot of talk, naturally. The Larkins had always thought they were better than others, their son was in prison for that terrible crime, Louise had been a pretty woman, this was acknowledged by the townspeople. She had been a guidance counsellor in the high school here but she had never been right since her son stabbed that woman 29 times. Where was the daughter? Nobody knew. Jack and Olive were driving out of town, and as they went past the burned down Larkin place, Olive said, looking out the car window, sad, sad, sad. Then she craned her neck a bit and said, oh, someone's parked out there. Behind the tree. Whose is that? The car belonged to the Larkin daughter. Suzanne had driven up from Boston the evening before, staying at the Comfort Inn on the outskirts of Crosby, making the reservation under her husband's name. This morning she had gone to the house what remained of it and called the only person in town she knew anymore, who in fact was the person who had called her to tell her about the situation when it happened, and this was her father's lawyer, Bernie Green. He said he would come pick her up she couldn't remember how to get to his house. Help me help me help me help me. Suzanne had been thinking this since she had seen the ghastly ruins of the house in the daylight this morning. Only one corner of the house remained, the rest was a pile of dark rubble and broken glass and blackened planks. A covering of low clouds swept over the sky, almost quilted in appearance. Sitting in her car, her knees bouncing, she picked at the skin near her fingernails, through the windshield she could see that the trunk of the maple tree had been charred as well. Help me help me help me. As Bernie pulled into the driveway, his tires rolling over the patches of black ash, Suzanne had a sensation of floating toward his car, she had known this man since she was a child. Tall, slightly overweight, he got out and opened the door on the passenger's side, and she got in, whispering, Bernie, while he said, Hello, Suzanne. They drove to his house in silence, a shyness had come over her. You look like your mother used to, said Bernie once he was standing in his office on the second floor of his house on River Road. Have a seat, Suzanne. He gestured toward the chair with the red velvet seat cushion. Suzanne Saturday. Take your coat. Bernie asked, and Suzanne shook her head. How is your mother? Does she know? Bernie sat down heavily in his chair behind the desk. Suzanne sat with the back of her hand to her mouth, then she leaned forward and said, she's really gone, Bernie. Last night when I said I was her daughter, she told me her daughter had died. Bernie just looked at her, his lids partway down. After a minute he asked, how's your work, Suzanne? Are you still in the AG's office? Yeah, yeah. Work is good. That part is good, Suzanne answered, sitting back. A tiny part of her relaxed. What division? Child protection, Suzanne said, and Bernie nodded. Suzanne said, it kills me, the job. I have a case right now Suzanne waved a hand briefly. Never mind. It's always like that, but I love it, my job. Bernie watched her. After a few moments Suzanne said, you know, I don't think my father ever thought I was a real lawyer. You know. You are a real lawyer, Suzanne. 
Oh, I know, I know. But for him, you know, Mr. Investment Banker, something like working in the Attorney General's office, in child protection especially I don't know. But he was proud of me. I guess. She looked at Bernie, he was looking down now. I am sure he was, Suzanne. But did he ever say that to you? That he was proud of me? Suzanne asked. Oh, Suzanne, said Bernie, raising his tired eyes. I know he was proud of you. Suzanne glanced over at the far window, with its long white drapes and a red valance at the top, the clouds could be seen through the drapes opening, spreading themselves out above the river. Suzanne looked back at Bernie. Bernie, can I tell you something? Bernie's eyebrows rose slightly in encouragement. When I was a little girl I used to have this stuffed dog called Snuggles. And I loved Snuggles, he was so soft. And when I came up here two years ago to help my father put my mother in that home, I found out well, I didn't even know Snuggles still existed, but my mother had become attached to it. And she was asleep when I got there last night and she was just clinging to Snuggles, and the people there the aides told me she loves that dog, sleeps with it, never lets it out of her sight. Suzanne bit the inside of her mouth, pushing her cheek with a finger. Bernie said, oh, Suzanne, and let out a big sigh. Suzanne's stomach growled, her head felt a little swimmy. She had had nothing except a cup of coffee early this morning, but she was vaguely glad to have the chattiness rise within her. Glancing about, she saw that Bernie's office was smaller than she had remembered, there was that gorgeous view of the river which she did seem to remember. In the corner was a tall clock that was not working. Suzanne crossed her legs, kicking her foot slightly, her brown suede boot bumped against the desk. My mother Suzanne paused. I don't know if you know this she had a little drinking problem. Honestly, I think she was always a little crazy. I think Doyle got her genes, that's what I think. And how is Doyle? Bernie asked this impassively, his hands in his lap. Well, he's medicated. Suzanne had to wait a moment before she could continue, her brother's story was carved into her deeply, it sat quietly tucked deep beneath her ribcage all the time. So he's okay, but he's a little bit of a zombie. Which is not bad, since he'll be there for the rest of his life. Before they got him doped up, he just cried all day long. All day long that poor boy wept. Oy vey, said Bernie. He shook his head, and Suzanne felt a sudden deep deep affection for this man she had known from such a young age. She saw that his eyes were blue, they were large eyes, watery with age. Let's get back to your mother for just a minute, Suzanne. So she didn't know who you were yesterday. And she has no idea about the fire? She has no idea your father died. Does she know anything about Doyle anymore? Suzanne sat back, her foot kicking into the air, and said, No, I don't think she has any idea about my father, and honestly. Suzanne looked at this man across from her. I didn't tell her. I understand, said Bernie. What would be the point? Well, exactly, said Suzanne. What would be the point? My father said that when he went to visit her, she'd get really abusive Suzanne passed a hand through the air. Oh, who knows. Anyway. She didn't mention Doyle, so I didn't either. No. Bernie shook his head, kindly. No, no, of course not. This is what Suzanne did not tell Bernie, that two years ago, on an instinct, she had driven up to visit her parents spontaneously, and when she had stepped up to the door of the house, she heard screaming inside. She had taken her key and let herself in, and in the living room her father was standing over her mother, who was sitting in a chair in a dirty nightgown, and her father was holding her mother by the wrists, lifting her and shoving her back down into the chair, lifting and shoving and yelling at her, I can't do this anymore, goddammit, I hate you. And her mother was screaming and trying to get away, but Suzanne's father kept her wrists in his hands. When her father turned and saw Suzanne, he sank down on the floor by the chair and began to weep, hard. Suzanne had never seen her father weep before, 
it had been unimaginable to her that he could. Her mother kept screaming from where she sat in the chair. Suzanne, her father said, his face wet, his chest heaving, Suzanne, I can't do it anymore. Oh, daddy, Suzanne said. She's been getting so much worse, you shouldn't have to take care of her alone. Suzanne had finally gotten her mother to bed, but she had seen the bruises on her mother's wrists, and she had been shocked to find more bruises on her mother's ankles, on her upper arms too, even at the top of her chest. Her father had stayed on the living room floor, and she sat down beside him, his red t-shirt was wet. Dad, she said. Dad, she's got bruises all over her. Her father said nothing, just hung his head in his hands. She had hired round-the-clock aides to come in, meeting with each one, telling them that her mother had fallen, but she had been scared scared to death that they would say something to the authorities, although they never did. But in one week's time there was a sudden opening at the Golden Bridge Rest Home, and Suzanne helped her father move her mother in, and Suzanne's father retreated to the upstairs, where he had been living for a while. Her father had said to Suzanne, please don't come back here again, you have your life, and you must live it. He had become a shell of a man, not even recognizable to her. Suzanne thought now that she Suzanne had not been quite right in the head since this had happened. She said, so every week, you know, I spoke on the phone with my father. Bernie scratched the back of his head. Tell me, he said. Every week I called him. Even if it was only for a few minutes. I mean, what did the man have to say? But we would chat, and I spoke to him the night he died. I mean, before he died, of course, and Suzanne's saying that made her think, oh, I'm really not right in the head. She said, I think I'm not right in my head. Not like my mother being crazy, just everything. Bernie raised his large hand. I know what you're saying. You're fine. You're under stress. You're not crazy, Suzanne. Of course you feel you're not right in your head. Oh, she loved him, this man. Suzanne closed her eyes briefly. Thank you, she said. And then she started to cry. She wanted to wail her head off, but her weeping came out only in little fits and starts. It was like waiting to throw up, she thought how you could sense it but it wasn't here yet. She was surprised that he had a box of tissues she hadn't noticed them sitting right on his large wooden desk. He pushed them forward to her, and she pressed a tissue to her eyes. After a moment she said, so you have people in here all ready to cry, like therapists do? She tried to smile at him. I mean, you're all set with the Kleenex box. People come here in various states of distress, Bernie said, and she realized of course that would be true. Well, I'm distressed, she said. She blew her nose, and scrunched the tissue up in her hand. Her crying went no further. Of course you're distressed. Your father, to whom you spoke each week on the telephone, has died horribly in a fire. I would think you'd be quite distressed, Suzanne. Oh, I am. I am. And also, I might be getting divorced. At this news, Bernie's eyelids dropped all the way down, and he shook his head in what Suzanne thought was great sympathy. After a moment he looked up and asked, Your sons? Suzanne noticed a small waste basket under the desk, and she bent down and tossed her tissue into it. Well, they both started college last year. One at Dartmouth, the other at Michigan. They have no idea we might be separating, thank God. But it's just oh, it's all awful. Bernie nodded. Suzanne said, it's my fault, Bernie. She hesitated and then said the words, I had an affair. A stupid, stupid little affair with her oh, a kind of creepy man and when I tell my husband I know he'll completely flip out and he'll want a divorce. She added, my husband is really she paused, looking for the right word. Well, his traditional. Bernie moved a piece of paper on his desk just slightly with his hand, and then finally he nodded one small nod. Why do you act like this is so normal? 
Suzanne squeezed her nose with her fingers. Bernie let out a sigh and said, because it is, Suzanne. Oh, man, not for me, it isn't. I feel like I've set off a bomb in my life. For years I felt like I was safe on an I don't know, like an island. I had floated away from all those troubles that poor Doyle had, I was safe on my island with my own family, my husband and my boys, and now I've blown it up. Loss can do this, Bernie said. Do what? Suzanne asked. Bernie opened his hands upward. Cause these, indiscretions. But when I had this crappy indiscretion, my father wasn't dead yet. But your sons have left you. Bernie pointed a finger toward the ceiling. He added, and six years ago your brother was sent to prison for life. And, as you put it, your mother is gone. Those are huge losses, Suzanne. These words rolled over Suzanne with a swiftness, as though something true had been said but she couldn't catch it. She gazed around his office. Oh, she wanted to stay here. A sudden crack of sunlight came through the far window, making a small strip of light across Bernie's desk, and she saw that on his desk was one small framed photograph, facing him. Who's that? she asked, nodding toward the frame. He turned it around so she could see. The couple, in black and white, looked like they were from the olden days, the man had a full beard and a suit with a skinny tie, and the woman had a hat tight on her head. My parents, he said. Really? Suzanne squinted at them. Were they, you know, orthodox? Bernie held up a hand and turned it one way, then another. Yes, no. Eventually no. Eventually? I thought if you were orthodox, you were orthodox. Bernie pressed his lips together, then gave a shrug. Well. You were wrong. They died in the camps, Bernie said. They pretended they were not Jews, but they were and so they died. Oh Jesus. Oh God. I'm so sorry. Suzanne's face got very hot. I had no idea, she said. Why would you have any idea? He looked at her with his eyelids half down. How did you end up in Maine, Bernie? Bernie seemed indifferent to the question. My wife and I wanted to get away from New York, and there was still is a Jewish community in Shirley Falls, so we came up here, but then we got tired of it, the community, so we moved to Crosby. She wanted to ask him how he'd come to New York after his parents had died in Europe, but she did not ask. She wanted also to ask about his faith. She wondered if he had lost his faith, if that's what he meant by being tired of the community. It would be natural wouldn't it? To lose your faith if you lost your parents in such a way? For many years Suzanne had had what she thought of privately as a faith of sorts, but this sensation had eluded her for a few years now, and she felt very bad about that. Oh, Bernie, she said. Then she asked, how are your kids? Grandchildren? They're all fine. He looked out the window then, and after a moment he said, ironically, they're all living back in New York. Which is fine, he added. Okay, Suzanne said. She did not ask about Bernie's wife, because Suzanne had just seen his wife they had said hello on her way upstairs to this office. His wife looked like a melted candle, this was what had gone through Suzanne's mind but she may have always looked like that, Suzanne could not remember. I wish I could stay right here, Suzanne said. Across the room was a sofa in the corner that matched the red velvet cushion chair she sat on. Bernie said, in Crosby. Oh God, no. No, I meant here. Right here in this room. I wish I could just stay here, is what I'm saying. Stay here as long as you like, Suzanne. There's no rush. But they spoke then about the estate. When Bernie told her the amount of money that would come to her, Suzanne sat up straight. Stop it, she said. Bernie, that's sickening. Your father made very good investments, Bernie said. She asked, what did he invest in? 
I know he was an investment banker, but what did he invest in that made all this money? My God, Bernie, that's a lot of money. South Africa, Bernie said, glancing at some sheets of paper in front of him. Way back. And also the pharmaceutical companies. Exxon, too. South Africa. Suzanne asked. Are you saying back when there was apartheid he was investing over there? Bernie nodded, and she said, but he didn't, Bernie. I asked him when Mandela got released from prison I asked my father if he had invested in South Africa and he said, no, Suzanne. He told me that. Bernie put the papers back into a folder. I'm giving it all away. Every penny. I don't want it. Suzanne sat back. My God, she said. Bernie said, do with it whatever you like. He told her she would have to cover the costs of cleaning the lot up although there was insurance and then they would put it on the market. It should go, I think, Bernie said. It's a great location, right there as you come into town. Someone will want it. Or not, said Suzanne, she was absolutely shocked about the amount of money. Or not. Bernie gave a small shrug. Finally Suzanne rose, and Bernie stood up as well. She went and put her arms around him, and after a moment he put his arms around her too. She hugged him more tightly, and then she felt him pull away just slightly, so she stopped hugging him and said, Thank you, Bernie. You've been wonderful. As she headed for the door, he said, Suzanne. She turned to him. Why do you need to tell your husband about your indiscretion? He was standing with both hands loosely on his hips. She said, because he's my husband. We can't live with this between us, it would be so, you know, so awful. As awful as getting divorced? What are you saying, Bernie? That I should live with this lie forever? He turned slightly, putting one hand to his chin, and then he turned back and said, you're the one who made the decision to have the affair. I think you should be the one who takes responsibility for it. Not your husband. She shook her head. We're not like that, Bernie. There have never been any secrets between us, and this would be too awful. I have to tell him. There are always secrets, Bernie said. Let's go. He extended his hand toward the doorway, and she went before him down the stairs. She had forgotten that he was to drive her back. Beneath the clouds which were even lower now sat the jagged part of the corner of the house that was still standing, and the gruesomeness of its remains looked exactly like what they were, remains. Thank you, Suzanne said. She got her car key from her handbag. It's okay. He turned his car off, and a faint thrill went through Suzanne, that he did not want to leave her yet. After a moment Bernie said, you know, it's not my business, but I wonder if you could see someone, a therapist. There has to be a good therapist in Boston. Just for now while you sort all these things out. Oh, Bernie, said Suzanne. She touched his arm briefly. I've been to a therapist. That's who I had my stupid affair with. Bernie closed his eyes for a long moment, then he opened them and stared straight ahead through his windshield. He said, Suzanne, I'm sorry. No, it was kind of my fault. I let him come on to me. It was not your fault, Suzanne. He looked at her now. It was very unprofessional, what he did. How long had you been seeing him? Two years. Suzanne added, since my mother went into that home is when I started seeing him. Oy vey, said Bernie. But it was just the last few months oh, it's so sordid, the whole thing, and you know his oh, no offence, Bernie but his old. You know. Yes, said Bernie. He added, of course he is. Please don't worry. Please. He should be reported, Bernie said and Suzanne said, I'm not going to report him. He raised a hand then and said, goodbye. Good luck, Suzanne. Call if you need me. 
Then he started his car, and she felt a terrible desolation return. She got out, and went and sat in her car while he drove out of the driveway. A few orangey leaves had fallen onto the hood from the tree above the car. She saw on her phone that her husband had texted to see if she was okay, and she texted back that she would call him soon. She looked through the car window at the charred remains of the house where she had grown up. Try, she thought to herself with a kind of fury, and what she meant was, try and have a good memory come to you. She could not do it. She could almost find no memories at all, just tiny fleeting images of her mother veering up from the dining room table at night, a wine glass in her hand, her father, as though in a shadow, walking down the stairs. Doyle, always so skittish, so intense. She turned her head and squinted at the part of Main Street she could see from here, and she thought of this town, where she had spent her youth, but she had gone to a private school in Portland and so the town had never felt as real to her as it otherwise might have. As a young girl she had taken Long's walks, alone, she had walked across the bridge and down by the coast, there was a good memory. Then she thought of Doyle sitting next to her in the car each morning, banging his knee, laughing. They'd had a real connection, because they both went to school out of town. And because she had loved him, her little brother. Most days her father drove them to school in Portland, and now Suzanne remembered him stopping at the gas station by Freeport, coming back out of the little store and tossing her a package of cellophane-wrapped donuts, six little ones covered in powder. Here you go, Twinkie, her father would say, because he would also buy Twinkies for both of them, as well, to have with their lunch. Back home, Bernie stepped into the kitchen and walked up behind his wife, who was washing dishes, and put his arms around her. She was a short woman, the back of her head was below his chin. Oi, Eva, he said, and his wife turned to him, her hands soapy. I know, she said. He held her to him with one arm then, and stood looking through the kitchen window at the cedar tree. That poor girl, his wife said, and Bernie said, yes. He went back upstairs to his office and sat for quite a while at his desk, turning his swivel chair to look out the window at the river. Suzanne had seemed more childlike than he would have thought from his telephone call to her with the news of her father's death, she had been calm and adult-sounding then. But he realized that faced with the image of that burned-down house, with the reality of all that had happened, she had been thrown. Still, she had surprised him with her acuity about her father, Roger Larkin had not, in fact, respected the truth that she was a lawyer, he had told Bernie a number of times that she was really just a social worker. Bernie sat with his hands on the armrests of the chair and pictured Roger in his younger years, a dark-haired handsome man with a pretty blonde wife, she had come from Philadelphia. Roger had come from poverty, in Holton, Maine, but he was smart and went to Wharton, and then he just made money, and more money. When Roger had first come to Bernie for legal advice, it had been about investments made in South Africa, he needed a loophole, which he had already figured out, and Bernie had advised him. Bernie had said to him that day, but I don't like this, Roger, and Roger had just smiled at him and said, you're my legal advisor, Bernie, not my priest. This had always stayed with Bernie, because he thought that a priest also had to hear the sorts of secrets that Bernie had to hear from his clients, but a priest was ostensibly pure, Bernie did not feel pure. Over the years, Roger Larkin had sat on the board of the Portland Symphony, and various other boards as well. One time, many years ago, Roger had walked into this office and said, I really need you for this one, Bernie. There had been an affair with a woman in his office, he had to have money arranged for her abortion in New York, and then she had sued him. Bernie had settled the suit quickly, and so it had not reached the papers. That part of her father Suzanne did not seem to know about. But more unsettling to Bernie he shifted in his chair was the fact that two years ago Louise Larkin had made a telephone call to Bernie, it was in the evening, and Bernie happened to be in his office preparing for a case the next day, and Louise had screamed into the telephone, he's trying to kill me. Help me, help. And then Roger had taken the telephone away from her and spoken to Bernie in a tired voice and said that his wife had dementia and he could not take care of her anymore. 
Bernie had talked to Roger for quite a while, and suggested that his wife was not so demented that she didn't know how to call him, and there might be a need to investigate if Louise was calling him for help about her physical safety. Roger had said, well, you do what you need to do, Mr. Lawyer Man. Bernie had done nothing. But the next week he had called Roger and helped get Louise into the Golden Bridge Rest Home, she jumped the waiting line because of Roger's money. Bernie did not hear from Roger again until six months ago, when Roger came to him with an updated will. Bernie watched the river, the clouds made the river seem grey, and then he stopped seeing the river and pictured Suzanne instead, the poor child, so pretty, like her mother had been, and so, so dazed. When she had tightened her hug with him before she left, he had felt what had he felt. He had wanted to pick her up and stroke her hair and make everything bad in her life go away. He remembered her then as she had actually been as a small girl, she had played with a doll very quietly in the corner of this room while her father had done business with Bernie. Uneasiness sat with Bernie now, and he realized it was an uneasiness he had felt on and off for years. His life had been tainted, he thought, by some of his clients, but none more than Roger Larkin had caused him to feel this way. He went into the bathroom, he heard the telephone ring, then stop. When he came out he saw the number and recognized that it was Suzanne's, she had left no message. He called her back, but she did not pick up. And so he just sat a day. A tenderness flooded through him. Suzanne was pulling into the parking lot of the Golden Bridge Rest Home. She had just left the Comfort Inn, where she had gone to pick up her bag, and the woman who worked there had frightened her, Suzanne had called Bernie, she was panicking. He had called her back as she was driving over the bridge and she hadn't answered, she had been afraid to talk on the phone and drive, she felt that swimmy in her head. Now she sat in her car and glanced at her phone, but remembering how Bernie had pulled away slightly as she hugged him she dropped the phone into her bag and sat with her eyes closed, thinking oh help me help me help me, and then she got out and went inside. Even though she had been there just the day before, the place still took her by surprise. Built back from the road, pleasant looking with its black shutters, it was a world unto itself, and the smell of cleaning fluids and also a whiff of human waste assaulted her the moment she stepped through the double doors. She moved past a man sitting in a wheelchair in the hallway and walked down to her mother's room. When she had come in last night, her mother had been asleep, and Suzanne had gasped at the sight of her. Her mother lay with her grey hair what was left of it sticking out on the pillow, and she was as tiny as a person could be and still be alive. It was as though her mother had been in a science fiction movie and that her body hair essence had been snatched. When her mother's eyes flipped open, Suzanne had said, It's me, Mom, Suzanne, and her mother had sat up and said, Hello. And when Suzanne repeated to her, Mom, it's me, your daughter, her mother said pleasantly, No, my daughter is dead. Then her mother had sung a lullaby as she rocked snuggles, and she was still doing that when Suzanne left. Now, as Suzanne entered the room, she had to walk by another woman seated in a wheelchair not far from her mother, the woman looked at her with filmy eyes, and when Suzanne waved her hand at the woman, there was no response. Her mother sat serenely in her wheelchair in the corner of her room, with snuggles on her lap. Her hair had been combed, and she wore a sweatsuit of pale off-white, on her feet were clean white sneakers. Hello, she said to Suzanne. You're a pretty woman. Who are you? I'm your daughter, Mon. It's me, Suzanne. Her mother said politely, I don't have a daughter. She died. But when she was a little girl, she had this. And her mother held up Snuggles. His name is Snuggles, her mother said. Mom, you remember this was Snuggles. Suzanne leaned down toward her mother. I don't know who you are, her mother continued, but my poor little daughter. She was always such a good girl. Suzanne sat slowly down on the edge of her mother's bed. But her brother. And her mother laughed then. Oh, her brother was a nasty little boy always wanting his willy played with. Oh, he always wanted me to play with his willy, oh my, he was a bad, bad boy. She laughed again. 
Chills ran down Suzanne's side, she felt them going all the way down her leg. Doyle, she finally asked. Her mother's face remained uncomprehending, until suddenly it became twisted in fury. You get out of here right now. Get out. Get out. Spittle flew from her mouth. And then the other woman seated in her wheelchair began to cry. It was a terrible sound of keening, almost. Susan stood up and went out into the hallway. Help me, please, she said to an aide going by. I've upset my mother and also some woman who was in here, I guess visiting her. The aide was a small young woman, with no expression on her face, and she said to Suzanne, I'll be there in a minute. Please come in now, said Suzanne, but the aide was already going into the room next door. Oh God, said Suzanne. She went back into her mother's room, past the woman who was crying so hard, and her mother was half standing out of her chair. She pointed her arm at Suzanne. You. Get out of here right now. An hour later, Bernie still could not get Suzanne out of his mind. He kept having an image of putting her onto his lap, and holding her to him tightly. That's enough, he thought, and took out a folder of a case he had to work on. When his telephone rang again, he saw that it was her, and he picked it up and said, Hello, Suzanne. He could hear that she was crying. Oh, Bernie, I'm so sorry to call you, I really am, but I... It's quite all right, Suzanne. I told you to call me anytime, and I meant it. If you call me again in ten minutes, I'll still mean it. I'm just so scared, she said. I'm so scared. I understand that. You have every reason to feel scared. But you're going to be all right. Bernie said this gently. I've known you for years, Suzanne. And you have always been focused and smart, and you're going to be just fine. You're in the middle of a storm at the moment. Don't hang up, Suzanne said. I'm right here, Bernie answered. You take your time. Where are you? Suzanne asked. So I can picture you. I'm sitting right at my desk. Alone, he added. Bernie, Suzanne said. First now, please listen to me and tell me the truth. Do you know if my father ever had an affair? The woman who works at the Comfort Inn, when I went back to get my bag, she said she recognized my name from the credit card I had paid with, and she said she had always loved my father she worked at that gas station in Freeport and she said my mother used to come into that gas station with him at noontime, always so nice with her red hair, but my mother never had red hair. There was a silence, then Bernie said, I'm not going to answer that. Well, I guess you just did. No. I didn't. After a moment Bernie added, you're a lawyer, and you know that privilege does not end with the death of a client. Okay, Suzanne said. But just hold on, okay? I'm right here, Suzanne. He added, I'm not going anywhere. He picked up a paperclip and touched it repeatedly to his desk. He heard her weeping, and then he heard her finally stop. Oh, Bernie. I know my father probably had an affair, he probably had a dozen affairs, and I don't want to be like my father. Suzanne. Bernie's voice was firm. He let the paperclip stay on his desk. You are not like your father. Do you hear me? You have always been you. And you alone. Then he said, where are you right now? At a rest stop on the turnpike. There's a mother with a little boy in there laughing about something and it reminds me of how I used to be with my boys. And they're still your boys, Bernie said. They always will be. But, Bernie, can I tell you one more thing? Of course you can. I stopped to see my mother before I left town, and she told me that Doyle had always been a bad boy, that he Suzanne was crying again. That he he always wanted her to play with his willy. Oh God, Bernie. Oh Jesus. Bernie was silent for quite a while, and then he said quietly, Oh, Suzanne. I don't know what to say about that. 
He leaned forward, setting a hand to his head as he held the telephone in the other. But do you think oh, Bernie, do you think she ever? Oh God, I work with kids like this. Even my creepy therapist told me that a guy, however nuts he is, doesn't stab a woman 29 times unless he has a lot of aggression toward a woman. Toward, you know, I guess his mother. I know what you're saying, Bernie said. And then after a moment he said, I guess we'll never know. No. And then Suzanne said, but, Bernie, it makes me so sad for that poor boy. You know, I'm going to visit him more often. I usually go once a month to see him there in Connecticut, but now that the boys are gone and I have more time, I'm going to go much more often. I just am, um, oh God, Bernie, that poor child. You go as often as you need to, Bernie said. When Suzanne spoke next she sounded exhausted. Bernie, my father was abusing my mother. She had bruises all over her before she went into that home. Bernie sat up straight, a kind of jolt went through him. He said quietly, I thought that might be true. You did? Why did you think it might be true? Bernie closed his eyes, then opened them, and said, it's not altogether unusual in those circumstances. Then he said, we got her into that place ahead of other people. How? Suzanne asked. Your father had money. That's how. You helped him do that? I did. Bernie felt himself blush. He was lying to her by not telling her how her mother had called him to say she was in danger. He opened his mouth, then closed it. Oh, Bernie. Well, thank you. She added, you probably saved her life. I never saved anyone's life, Bernie said. Suzanne said, Bernie. Bernie. Do you realize what I came from? Do you realize that? Oh my God, those people. How did I get out alive? Then Suzanne said, but you did too. You got out as well. She added, except your parents were murdered, and mine were well, they almost were murderers, Bernie. And my brother is a murderer. Oh my God. Bernie said, but you got out. Just as you said. Suzanne asked, how did you get out of, where were you born? Hungary. Bernie spread his hand over his face briefly. He wanted to commend her for everything she had done with her life, to say that she had lived decently by helping those children every day through the AG's office, and by raising her boys, and by her loyalty to Doyle. But instead he answered her question. I got out when I was a kid, because my uncle came to America and my parents wanted me to come with him, they said they would join us soon. And then they didn't. I didn't know you were born in Hungary. Do you remember your parents at all? Bernie glanced around his office before he answered her. It had been a long time since he had spoken of these things to anyone. Well, I remember my father reading the Torah. I remember my mother setting the table. And I remember her reading to me when I was sick one time and in bed. Oh, Bernie. Suzanne's voice sounded stronger now. Bernie, can I just ask you one last thing? Of course, Suzanne. Do you have any faith? Religious faith, I mean. Bernie felt a physical response to this as though a small wave had just rolled through his chest. He waited and then he said, you know, I've lived for many years as a secular Jew, and I don't believe I have any faith in that sense. But, Suzanne asked, there's a but I can hear it in your voice. A tentative earnestness spread through Bernie now. He felt as though he had been called upon to give something of himself that was far outside his purview as a lawyer and it was something he had never given to anyone, except his wife, vaguely, years ago. Okay, he said. The but is this, but do I have faith? I do. The problem is, I can't describe it. But it's a faith of sorts. It is a faith. Can you tell me? Oh, please tell me, Bernie. Bernie put his hand to the back of his neck. 
I can't, Suzanne. Because I don't have words to describe it. It's more an understanding I've had it most of my life that there is something much larger than we are. He felt a sense of failure, he had failed in telling this. Suzanne said, I used to feel that. For years I would have sensations of just what you described. But I can't really describe it either. Bernie did not answer, and Suzanne continued. When I was a kid, and alone I spent a lot of time alone, you know, when I wasn't at school I would take these walks and I would get this feeling, this very deep sensation, and I understood only the way a kid could understand these things that it had something to do with God. But I don't mean God like some father figure, I don't even know what I mean. I know what you mean, Bernie said. And I kept having that feeling every so often right into my adult life, I never told anybody, because what was there to tell? I understand that completely, Bernie said. But I haven't had it for a few years, and so I wonder, did I make it up? But I know I didn't, Bernie. I never told my husband, I never told anybody. But whenever someone says they're an atheist, I always privately have this bad reaction, and they give all the obvious reasons, you know, kids get cancer, earthquakes kill people, all that kind of stuff. But when I hear them, I think, but you are barking up the wrong tree. She added, but I couldn't say what the right tree is or how to bark up it. Sitting at his desk, Bernie felt a vague sense of disbelief, everything she was saying was entirely understandable to him. Then Suzanne added, I don't know why I don't get that feeling that sensation anymore. Bernie looked out at the river, it had changed, as it always did, it was now a greener colour, as the cloud covering went higher up into the sky. You will, he said. Suzanne said, you know what, Bernie? I've thought about this at LOT. A L O T. And here is the well, the phrase I've come up with, I mean just for myself, but this is the phrase that goes through my head. I think our job maybe even our duty is to her voice became calm, adult-like. To bear the burden of the mystery with as much grace as we can. Bernie was silent for a long time. He said finally, thank you, Suzanne. After another moment Suzanne said, the only other person I told about those feelings of well, of God, or something so much bigger well, I told that creepy therapist, after, you know, after we began anyway, you know what he said. He said, don't be ridiculous, Suzanne. You were a child mystified by life, and you now think it was God you felt. You were just mystified by life, that's all. Isn't that creepy, Bernie? Bernie glanced at the ceiling. Creepy? Yes. He was a very limited man, Suzanne. I know it, Suzanne said. Then she said, do you really think I shouldn't tell my husband about him? Do you think I can really live with it on my own? People live with things, Bernie said. They do. I am always amazed at what people live with. He added, and, Suzanne, you just told me your husband doesn't know about your experience with, with whatever it is we've been talking about. You're right, Suzanne said. Bernie, you're so smart. I love you. Bernie said, and, Suzanne, I love you. He wished terribly to tell her that he felt better now, that having talked to her in this way his uneasiness had been alleviated somewhat. Instead he said, one more thing. Now listen to me. I'm listening, Suzanne said. He said, you hang up and have yourself a good cry. Have a cry like you've never had in your life. And when you're done, get yourself something to eat. I bet you haven't eaten a thing all day. You're right, I haven't. And I will eat something, I promise. But I don't feel like crying anymore, Bernie. I feel, I feel like I could practically sing. Then do that, he said. And Suzanne, sitting in her car at the rest stop on the turnpike, did not sing. But she sat there for a long while, thinking about their conversation. She thought she would never forget it, it was as though huge windows above her had been smashed the way the firemen must have smashed the windows of her childhood home and now, here above her and around her, was the whole wide world right there, 
available to her once again. She watched as the mother and the young boy got back into their car, laughing at something together. In front of her was a small maple tree, the leaves pink from top to bottom. Oh, Bernie, she whispered. Wow. Bernie sat at his desk, staring out at the river. A kind of quiet astonishment went through him. Somehow, Suzanne had remained uncorrupted, her guilelessness in talking to him was a gift of no small proportion. She was an innocent, this came to her as naturally as breathing, and he felt right now as though her innocence had washed over him, removing some of the areas of disquiet he had gathered over the years in his profession. In a moment he would go downstairs and tell his wife that they need not worry about Suzanne. About the particularities of their conversation he would say nothing, the way Suzanne had helped him would remain his secret. Harmless enough, he thought, standing up, when you considered the variety of secrets people had been keeping to themselves for years. Light Cindy Coombs pulled her shopping cart out of the way of a young couple and saw the man look at her. She saw him look away, then she saw him look at her again. Somehow the man's look made her touch the zipper on her winter coat it was a pale blue quilted coat and the zipper was halfway open and she walked past the two of them down the aisle even though what she needed two cans of tomato soup was exactly where the couple was standing. Up the next aisle she went, slowly, the shopping cart, with its wobbly wheel, making a bumping sound. In her cart there was milk and a loaf of bread. She stopped and turned toward the raisins, unzipping her coat more in order to tighten her belt. Then she kept going, not sure what to do. Tomato soup and what was it? Butter. In her head she kept saying butter, butter, and tried to think where the butter was, and it was where it always was, over past the milk, many kinds of butter waited. Where was the kind they always got? Where was it? Cindy leaned forward to get a different kind, what did it matter, and then she saw the kind they usually got and as she leaned over to get it, she started to fall, and caught herself on the handrail of her shopping cart. She pictured her legs as two little stagnant streams, with twigs and dirt, how could they hold her up? From behind her, a large elderly hand reached and took the butter that Cindy had been reaching for, it got tossed into her cart. Turning, she saw Mrs. Kitteridge standing there, and Mrs. Kitteridge just looked at her, straight in the eye. Hello. Cindy, Mrs. Kitteridge finally said. You're having a hell of a time. Many years ago, Mrs. Kitteridge had taught Cindy in a junior high math class, Cindy had not especially liked her. Cindy said, I am, Mrs. Kitteridge. I am having a hell of a time. Mrs. Kitteridge nodded once, and still she stood there. Well, let's figure out what you need, and get you out of here. I need two cans of tomato soup, Cindy said. Let's get the soup. Mrs. Kitteridge did not have a cart, just a basket, and she put the basket into Cindy's cart and took hold of the rail of the shopping cart, but she left room for Cindy to hold it as well, the sleeves of Mrs. Kitteridge's coat were bright red, and her hands around the rail of the shopping cart were puffy and old looking. Where is the damn soup? This place is such a barn these days, you can walk for miles and miles. And it's a Saturday, so a lot of people are in here. Olive Kitteridge was a big woman, she spoke almost over Cindy's head. Around the corner here, I think, said Cindy, and she saw with some relief that the couple who had been standing near the soup had left. Cindy put two cans of tomato soup into her cart, and Mrs. Kitteridge walked with her to the checkout. Cindy paid for her items, put them in the reusable cloth bag she had brought with her and then she felt compelled to wait for Mrs. Kitteridge, who said, one second there, Cindy, and I'll walk you to the car. Together they left the place, and in the huge glass doors that slid open right before they opened Cindy caught her own image, and she could not believe it. The wall cap on her head did not cover its baldness, and her eyes were sunken so far in she felt the prick of awe. I don't think I'll be coming here again, she said to Mrs. Kitteridge as she walked to her car. I only came because Tom wanted me to. Ah, uh, said Mrs. Kitteridge, the bag she carried banged against her side. Around them a sudden gust of wind sent a few twigs swirling, 
and a muddy plastic bag that had been run over a number of times rose slightly, then dropped back to the ground among slushy car tracks from the old snow. Cindy opened the door to her car, got in, and realized Mrs. Kitteridge was waiting. I'm okay now. Goodbye, Mrs. Kitteridge. The woman nodded, and Cindy did not turn to look at her once she pulled her car out. The drive seemed interminable, though it was less than a mile, and because it was a Saturday afternoon, it seemed to Cindy that there was more traffic than usual. When she got home she left the car in the driveway, though the door to the garage was open. The Christmas wreath was still on the front door, and she wished Tom would take it down. She must have told him a hundred times that now it was well into February, the Christmas wreath should come down. Cindy put the groceries onto the counter in their cloth bag. Hi, honey, she called to her husband, and Tom came into the kitchen and said, Hey, Cindy C. You did it. He took the butter and the soup and the milk from the bag and said, Want to watch some TV? She shook her head and moved past him up the stairs. Too late she remembered about the Christmas wreath, she would remind him later. Twenty years ago they had built this house. To Cindy it had seemed huge. She had been embarrassed by it as she watched the construction, the basement poured, the two by fours going up, she and Tom had seemed too young for such a large house. Cindy had grown up right outside of Crosby, in a house that had been very small, they had had almost no money she and her mother and her two sisters. Her father had left the family years earlier, and Cindy's mother worked night shifts at the hospital as a nurse's aide, it had not been easy. But Cindy had been lucky, she had gone to the university, paying her way and borrowing money. And there she had met her husband, who went on to work in the accounting office at the ironworks where he had been ever since. Only later did Cindy realize that this house they had built was a regular size house, with three bedrooms upstairs and a living room and dining room and kitchen downstairs. A few years later they built the garage, attached to the house, and instead of that making the place look bigger, somehow it caused the house to seem smaller. A perfect size house, four years she had thought that. But as the boys reached adolescence, she started to think that the house looked ordinary, and she asked Tom if it could be painted a robin's egg blue. The boys had objected, she let it go, and the house had remained white all these years. Cindy lay down on the bed and looked through the window at the tops of the trees, the limbs bare, and yet there was that funny little soft sun that sneaks around on a cloud-filled afternoon in February what was it? The bare branches seemed to reach out, reach out, the opposite of shrinking. When she saw Tom standing in the doorway of the bedroom, his face open, looking to please, absolutely helpless, she said, you know what I've been thinking lately? What, sweetheart? Tom came into the room and reached for her hand. What have you been thinking? How I want to paint this house blue, and we never did it, because the boys and you said no, you didn't want to. Tom's big face seemed in her eyes to get slightly bigger, and he said, well, let's do it now, sweetheart. We can have the house painted any color you want. Let's do that. Cindy shook her head. No, I mean it. Tom bent his head down toward her. It would be fun, sweetie heart. Let's paint the house. No. She shook her head again and turned her face away from him. Sweetheart. Oh, Tom. Stop. Please. I said no. We are not going to paint the house now. She waited a moment, then said, Honey, can you please take down the wreath that's still on the front door? Right now, he said, nodding. Sweetie heart, consider the wreath gone. Before her illness, Cindy had worked as a librarian at the local library. She loved books, oh, did she love books. She loved the feel of them, and the smell of them, and she had loved the semi-quiet of the library, as well as the old people who came sometimes for the whole morning, just to have a place to go. She had liked helping them get online with a computer, or finding the magazine they wanted to read. Most of all, she had loved checking out books, mentioning to people the books she liked, these people would come back and talk to her about the books they had read at her suggestion. 
Cindy used to read everything, and even now there were books piled on the table beside the bed, books were piled up on the windowsill, and some on the floor as well. She almost had no preference for any kind of book, and she had sometimes thought that odd. She had read Shakespeare and the thrillers of Sharon MacDonald, and biographies of Samuel Johnson and different playwrights, silly romance novels, and also the poets. She thought, privately, that poets just about sat on the right hand of God. When she was young, Cindy had thought about being a poet what a silly idea. But as a child she had liked poetry, her third grade teacher had given her a copy of Edna St. Vincent Millay's poem Selected for Young People. And when her little sister coloured all over it in red crayon, Cindy hit her. Always this memory caused Cindy deep pain, because of what had happened later to her little sister. But Cindy had memoized all the poems in the book before they were coloured over in red, and she felt somehow that it had ushered her into a world far away from her tiny home. This was partly because her teacher had told her that Edna St. Vincent Millay had grown up in Maine too, only an hour away, and that the poet, as a young girl, had been raised in poverty. The teacher had been kind in how she said that, and it was not until years later that Cindy realized it was to help her, Cindy, with her own circumstances of need. Cindy had written some poetry, but only for herself, she knew nothing about it, really. Andrea Elrias, who was two years younger than Cindy, had become the Poet Laureate of the United States a year ago, and Cindy felt a vast and secret pride that this person from Crosby, Maine, had accomplished such a thing. In truth, Cindy did not always understand the poetry that Andrea wrote. But it was brave, Cindy knew that. The poetry was a lot about Andrea's life, and Cindy understood, reading it, that she, Cindy, could never have done what Andrea did. She could never have written about her mother in such a way, could never have written down the revulsion she felt at the sight of her mother's cheeks drawing in as she smoked, nor even could she have written anything about herself. What she would have written about was the light in February. How it changed the way the world looked. People complained about February, it was cold and snowy and oftentimes wet and damp, and people were ready for spring. But for Cindy the light of the month had always been like a secret, and it remained a secret even now. Because in February the days were really getting longer and you could see it, if you really looked. You could see how at the end of each day the world seemed cracked open and the extra light made its way across the stark trees, and promised. It promised, that light, and what a thing that was. As Cindy lay on her bed she could see this even now, the gold of the last light opening the world. The next day, Sunday, after lunch, Cindy returned to bed, and Tom came upstairs with her, trying to be helpful, arranging the pillows, straightening the quilt. A car could be heard coming up the driveway, and Tom pulled back the curtain and looked out. Oh Christ, he said. It's that old bag. Olive Kitteridge. What in hell is she doing here? Let her in, Cindy said, her voice muffled in the pillows. What, sweetheart? Cindy sat up. I said, let her in. Please, Tom. Are you crazy? Tom asked. Yes. Let her come in. And so Tom went down the stairs and Cindy heard him open the front door, which they never used, and in a moment Mrs. Kitteridge came up the stairway, followed by Tom and she stood in the doorway of the bedroom. She wore her red coat, which was rather puffy, the way winter coats can be. Hi, Mrs. Kitteridge, Cindy said. She sat up in the bed, putting the pillows behind her back. Tom, can you take her coat? And so Mrs. Kitteridge took off her coat and handed it to Tom, who said, Cindy. You want me to stay? Cindy shook her head at him, and he went back downstairs with the coat of Mrs. Kitteridge. Mrs. Kitteridge was wearing black slacks and a jacket-type thing that went halfway down her thighs, its print was of bright reds and orange swirls. She placed her black leather bag on the floor. Call me Olive. If you can. I know sometimes a person can't when I've been Mrs. Kitteridge all their life. Cindy looked up at this woman before her, 
she saw in her eyes a distinct light. I can call you Olive. Hello, Olive. Cindy looked around and said, here, pull up that chair. Olive pulled the chair over toward the bed, it was a straight back chair, and Cindy hoped that she could fit on it comfortably. But with her coat off, Olive didn't look quite as large, and she sat on the chair and folded her hands in her lap. I thought if I called you might say I shouldn't come over. Olive waited. Then she said, and I thought, hell's bells, I want to go over and see that girl. So I just got in the car and came. It's fine, Cindy said. I'm glad you did. How are you, Olive? The question is you. You're not okay. No, I'm not. Any chance you will be? 50%. Is what they say. Then Cindy added, I have my last treatment next week. Mrs. Kitteridge looked straight at Cindy. I see, she said. Then she looked around the room at the white bureau, and the clothes hanging over another chair in the corner, and all the books stacked on the windowsill before looking back at Cindy. So you feel crappy? What do you do all day? Do you read? It's a problem, Cindy acknowledged. Because I do feel crappy. And I don't read as much as I used to. I can't really concentrate. Olive nodded, as though considering this. Yeah, she said. Then she added, hell of a mess to be in. Well, it is kind of. I should say so. The woman sat there, her hands still folded in her lap. It didn't appear she had anything else to say. And so Cindy blurted out, Oh, Mrs. Kitteridge. Olive. Oh, Olive, I'm so I'm so angry. Olive nodded. I should think to God you would be. I want to feel peaceful, I want to accept this, but I am so angry, I'm just angry every minute, and when I saw you in the store, people had been looking at me. I don't want to go out, people look at me and they get afraid. Yeah, Olive said. Then she added, well, I'm not afraid. I know that. I mean, I appreciate it. How's Tom? Oh, Tom. Cindy sat up, and the bedclothes seemed to her almost soiled, although they had been changed the day before, but there was that faint odor of something like metal that she had smelled for months now. Olive, he keeps talking like I'll get better. I can't believe it, I just can't believe it, it makes me so lonely, oh dear God, I am so lonely. Olive made a grimace of sympathy. God, Cindy. That sucks. As the kids used to say. That really sucks. It does. Cindy lay back on her pillow, watching this woman who had come over uninvited. There's a nurse who comes in twice a week, and she told me Tom was acting like every man she's ever seen in these situations. That men just can't deal with it. But it's terrible, Olive. He's my husband and we've loved each other now for many years, and this is awful. Olive sat looking at Cindy, then looking at the foot of the bed. I don't know, she said. I don't know if it's a male thing or not. The truth is, Cindy, I wasn't very good to my husband during his last years. Cindy said, yes, you were. Everyone knew you went to the nursing home every day to see him. Olive shook her head. Before that. He was sick before that. I don't know, Olive said thoughtfully. He may have been and I just didn't know it. He became very needy. And I wasn't I just wasn't very nice to him. It's something I think about a lot these days, and it bugs me like hell. Cindy waited a moment. Well, if you didn't know he was sick. Olive heaved a deep sigh. I know, I know. But I'm just saying, I wasn't especially good to him, and it hurts me now. It really does. At times these days rarely, very rarely, but at times I feel like I've become, oh, just a tiny tiny bit better as a person, and it makes me sick that Henry didn't get any of that from me. Olive shook her head. Here I go, talking about myself again. 
I've been trying not to talk about myself so much these days. Cindy said, talk about anything you want. I don't care. Take a turn, Olive said, raising a hand briefly. I'm sure I'll get back to myself. Cindy said, one time, it was on Christmas Day, I just began to cry. I cried and cried, and my sons were both here and so was Tom, and I stood on the stairs, just wailing, and then I noticed that they had all left, they walked away from me until I stopped crying. Olive's eyes closed briefly. Oh Godfrey, she murmured. I scared them. Yeah. And now they will always think of that, every Christmas to come, my sons will remember that. Probably. I did that to them. Olive sat forward and said, Cindy Coombs, there's not one goddamn person in this world who doesn't have a bad memory or two to take with them through life. She sat back and crossed her feet at her ankles. But I'm scared. Oh, I know, I know, of course you are. Everyone is scared to die. Everyone? Is that true, Mrs. Kitteridge? Are you scared to die? I am scared to death to die, is the truth. Olive adjusted herself on the chair. Cindy thought about this. I've heard of people who make peace with it, she said. I guess that can happen. I don't know how they do it, but I think it can happen. They were quiet. Cindy felt she almost felt normal. Well, she said finally. It's just that I'm so alone. I don't want to be so alone. Course you don't. You're scared to die, even at your age. Olive nodded. Oh Godfrey, there were days I'd have liked to have been dead. But I'm still scared of dying. Then Olive said, you know, Cindy, if you should be dying, if you do die, the truth is we're all just a few steps behind you. Twenty minutes behind you, and that's the truth. Cindy had not thought of that. She had thought that Tom, and her sons, and people that they would go on living forever and ever, without her. But Olive was right, they were all headed where she was going. If she was going. Thank you, Cindy said. And thank you for coming over. Olive Kitteridge stood up. By now, she said. When Cindy's mother was dying she had been 52 and Cindy had been 32 her mother had screamed and wept and cursed Cindy's father for abandoning them years before. In truth, Cindy's mother had frequently, during Cindy's lifetime, screamed and wept, the poor woman had been so tired. But when her mother was dying it scared Cindy terrifically, how her mother carried on, and she had thought to herself, I will not die that way. And this is why she felt so bad that she had done that to her sons by crying hard on the stairs on Christmas Day. Cindy had not, during her sons' lives, screamed and wept. Cindy had cared for them every single second, it seemed like this to her, and she had hugged them and held them when they were small and needed comfort. She thought about this a great deal, and she thought about it a few nights later as she sat next to Tom on the couch, a blanket pulled up to her throat watching television with him. She said, during a television commercial, Honey, I feel so bad about that day I cried on the stairs with you and the boys here. I told Mrs. Kitteridge. I forgot to tell her it reminds me of my mother. Tom pulled back and looked at her quickly. Mrs. Kitteridge. Why would you tell that old bag anything so personal? Well Cindy began. Did you hear she got married to Jack Kennison? She did? Cindy started to sit up straight. Yes, she did. Can you imagine anyone marrying that old bag, except for her poor first husband, Henry? After that, Cindy didn't say much. A few days later the weather turned bad. It rained and was also sleeting, and as Tom was getting things ready for her her lunch was in the refrigerator, the phone was near her bed. Another cell phone was in bed with her as he was doing these things before he went to work at the ironworks, she found that he was irritating her. It's okay, honey, just go, she said. Are you sure, he asked, and she said that she was sure, 
just please go now. And so off he went, calling once more from down the stairs, goodbye, sweetie heart. And she called back to him, and then he was finally gone. Cindy dozed, and when she woke she was annoyed that Tom hadn't left any lights on in the house. He was too cheap, is what she thought, it was depressing with no lights on, and so she got herself out of bed and went about the bedroom, turning on the lamp on the bureau and the one beside her bed, although through the bedroom door the hallway remained grey. Her phone whistled. There was a text from her sister-in-law Anita, asking, can I call? Cindy sat on the edge of the bed and texted back yes. You doing okay, asked Anita. And Cindy said, yeah, it was the same as usual. Sorry I haven't been by this week, I'll come soon. And Anita started to speak of her problems at home, which Cindy felt bad for Anita's kids were all kind of crazy, they were in high school. Cindy got up to walk into the hallway to turn more lights on, and she had a car in the driveway and going over to look out the window she saw Mrs. Kitteridge getting out of her car. Anita, Cindy said, Mrs. Kitteridge just drove up. I told you how she came to visit me. Well, she's here again. Anita laughed. Well, have a good time. Like I said, I always kind of like that woman, myself. The rain was coming down hard, and Mrs. Kitteridge did not have an umbrella. Cindy rapped on the window, and Mrs. Kitteridge looked up. Cindy waved her arm for Mrs. Kitteridge to come in, then she pointed to the side door, and in a few minutes the side door had opened and closed and there was Mrs. Kitteridge standing in her coat at the bedroom door. Take off your coat, Cindy said. I'm sorry you got wet. Just throw it on the floor. Unless you want it hung up. If you want it hung up, then but Mrs. Kitteridge tossed her coat the same red puffy one, onto the rug and she sat down in the straight-backed chair once again. Her hair was plastered to her head from the rain. Drops landed on her collar and she stood up and said to Cindy, where's the bathroom? And Cindy indicated where it was, and in a moment Olive came back with a pink and white striped hand towel and she sat down again and toweled her hair, Cindy kind of couldn't believe it. Cindy said, Mrs. Kitteridge, did you get married? Tom said he heard you married Jack Kennison, but I thought, that can't be right. Olive Kitteridge held the towel above her head and looked at the wall. She said, yes, it's true. I have married Jack Kennison. Cindy stared at her. Well, congratulations. I guess. Is it weird? Oh, it's weird. Olive looked at her and nodded. It is weird. Yes, Siri. Olive hesitated, and then, starting to dry her hair again, she added, but we're both old enough to know things now, and that's good. What things? When to shut up, mainly. What things do you shut up about? Cindy asked, and Olive seemed to think about it, and then she said, well, for example, when he has his breakfast, I don't say to him, Jack, why the hell do you have to scrape your bowl so hard? Cindy asked, how long have you been married? Coming up to almost two years, I guess. Imagine at my age, starting over again. Olive put the towel in her lap and raised one opened hand slightly. But it's never starting over, Cindy, it's just continuing on. For quite a while they sat in silence, and the rain could be heard on the roof. And then Olive said, I don't imagine you want to think of Tom starting over. Cindy let out a great sigh. Oh, Mrs. Kitteridge, I can't stand to think of him alone. I can't stand it, really, I can't. He'd be just a oh, he'd be like a big huge baby all alone, and that breaks my heart. But that he might be with someone, it breaks my heart more. Olive nodded as though she understood this. You know, Cindy, you and Tom grew up together. Henry and I were like that. 18 when we met, 21 when we married, and the truth is that's who you lived with, that never ever goes away. Olive gave a shrug. It just doesn't. Do you talk about Henry to Jack Kennison? Olive looked at her. Oh, yes. 
When Jack and I first met, we talked about his wife and my husband non-stop. Non-stop. Was that uncomfortable? God, no. It was wonderful. Cindy lay silent for a while. I don't know that I want to be talked about. Olive shrugged. Not much you can do about it, if it comes to that. But I'll tell you this, you will be sainted. You will become an absolute saint. Cindy laughed. She laughed. And Olive, after a moment, laughed as well. Then Cindy said, your son. Does he like this Jack Kennison? Olive said nothing for a moment. Then she said, no, he does not. But I don't think he likes me much either. Even before I married Jack. Oh, Olive, I'm sorry. Olive's foot was bobbing up and down. Aya, she said. Nothing to do about it at this point. Cindy hesitated, and then she asked, were things always bad with your son? Olive tilted her head as though thinking about this, and then she said, I really don't know. I don't think so. Not for a while. Maybe things started with his first wife. After a minute, Cindy who turned her gaze toward the window, and saw the greyness of the sleet that was splattering against it said, well, I'm sure you didn't scream and yell a lot like my mother did. She was difficult, Olive. But then, she had a difficult life. She turned her face back to Olive. And Olive said, oh, I think I did scream and yell a lot. Cindy opened her mouth, but Olive continued. I can't honestly remember, but I think I did. I was pretty awful when I felt like it. My son probably thinks I'm a difficult woman, like you think your mother was. Well, I still loved her, Cindy said. Yeah. And I suppose Christopher loves me. Olive shook her head slowly. The two women were silent for a few minutes. Olive held the towel in her lap. Then Olive leaned forward and said quietly, I will tell you this, Cindy. There are times I miss Henry so much I feel that I can't breathe. She sat back, and Cindy thought there might be tears in her eyes. Olive blinked, then she finally said, I miss him so much, Cindy, right out of the blue and it's not because Jack isn't good to me, he is, mostly but something will happen and I will think Henry. I'm awfully glad you came over, Cindy said. You wouldn't believe the people who don't come over to see me. Yes, I would. Believe it. But why don't they come see me? I mean, Olive. Old friends don't even come see me. They're scared. Well, too bad. Oh, I agree. I agree with you about that. But you're not scared. Nope. Even though you're scared of dying. That's right, Olive said. The weather remained nasty, the wind whistled through the windows and it rained and then snowed briefly and then rained again. To Cindy it seemed like this went on for days. In the mail during this time she received a card from the librarians she had worked with. It had a flower on it, and inside it said, get well soon. And everyone had signed their names. Cindy threw it into the waste basket. The nurse came and changed the bed, and Cindy was glad to see her. They spoke briefly and companionably. But when the nurse finally left, Cindy got back into bed and pulled the covers up almost over her head. She listened to Pandora on her phone, with her earplugs in, which was something she did more and more. There was no sense today that she could read a book, she did not want to read a book. And she did not want to watch any movie on the iPad that Tom had bought her for that purpose. Then she took her phone and texted her sons, who were both at the university. One more to go, she wrote, I love you both. And in a few minutes, they had both texted back, we love you too, mom. Her older boy texted again and said, good luck with the last one. And she wrote back, thank you honey, and sent him a kiss emoticon. She wanted to write more, to say, but I really 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 love you. But there was no point in that. 
There were so many things that could not be said, and this had occurred to Cindy with more frequency and it made her heart ache. But she was very tired, and in a way that helped her, for she gave herself over to it, listening to her music on her phone. When she dozed, she did not feel herself fall asleep, and so she was surprised when she woke up. Toward the end of the day, Anita stopped by on her way home from work, and Cindy sat at the kitchen table with her. Anita's husband Tom's brother might be losing his job, and Cindy said, Anita, you have a lot of stuff going on, and Anita said, I do. And so do you, and then Anita laughed, she had a burble of a laugh, and she pushed her glasses up her nose, and Cindy put her hand over Anita's. And Maria with those tattoos, Anita said. Up and down each arm, and I told her, well, you just wait till that arm gets flabby. And she said, I'm getting them on my butt too. Tom came through the door then, and Cindy asked if Anita wanted to stay for supper, and Anita said, God, I would love to stay for supper. And she got up and put her coat on. But I got to feed that freaking family of mine. The next day the sun came out. It shone brightly as Cindy walked across the driveway to the car with Tom who had taken the morning off to go with her for her last treatment, and she noticed the sun but almost nothing else, and she didn't say much to Tom as he drove her to the hospital. Once there she sat as she had before, for more than an hour while the stuff was dripped into her, then Tom helped her get back into the car and he said, I'm going to stay right with you, Cindy. All day. Back at the house, Cindy got into bed, and pretty soon Tom came up the stairs and sat on the bed next to her. He was eating an apple, and Cindy could not stand the sound of it. He crunched the apple, and there were slurping sounds too, and she finally said, Tom, can you finish that apple somewhere else? And he looked hurt, and said, okay, and went back downstairs. Exactly a week after Cindy's final treatment, Olive Kitteridge showed up, and she said, congratulations. What's next? A scan in three months. So we wait. Okay, then. After a moment, Olive said, Jack and I had a fight. Boy, it was a whopper. Cindy said, Oh, Olive, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah, well, I'm sorry to report it. It had to do with our friends. Our social life, as Jack put it. Cindy lay back on her cushions and watched Olive. Her face seemed to be moving, she was distressed. You want to tell me? Cindy asked. Well, he has these friends from his former life, the Rutledges, and I said the other night after we'd had dinner with them, there's nothing wrong with Marion Rutledge that a pin wouldn't fix. Here Olive raised her hand, fingers together, and made a jabbing motion in the air. So stuffed up on herself, that woman, honest to good God. And he took offence. He took offence, and then. He said, well, Olive, your friends are rather provincial. He said that. He said that they never asked him about himself God, what a male thing to say. And that he found them to be pro viencio. And I told him what was provincial was the fact that he cared that his daughter is gay that he should be ashamed about calling anyone provincial when he feels that way. I said it's more than provincial. Mr. Harvard smarty pants, it puts you right back in the dark ages. I got so furious that I got into the car and drove, and do you know where I thought I was driving to? Home. I thought I was going to drive back to where I used to live with Henry, and it took me a few minutes to realize that that house isn't even there anymore. So I drove out to the point, and I sat in the car, and I bawled like a baby, and then I drove back to Jack's house, well, our house, I suppose, and... Here's the thing. He was waiting for me, and he felt terrible. He felt awful that he had said those things. And I had been thinking about it on the drive back to the house, and I realized I'm a peasant and Jack is not. I mean, it's a class thing. So when I got back and saw that he was so sorry, I told him that, the business about this being a class thing, very calmly, and do you know? We must have talked for two hours straight, we just talked and talked, and he said he was kind of a peasant too, and that's why he was so sensitive about people being provincial, because all his life he had deep down felt provincial, and he didn't want to be. He said, 
I'm a snob, Olive, and I'm not proud of that. His father was a doctor, you know, outside of Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, and I thought that was hardly being a peasant, but his father was a general practitioner with an office in the back of their rather small house, and Jack said he felt like he never fit into the school there, and then his first wife, Betsy, well, she was to the manor born, she was from Philadelphia, a Bryn Mawr girl. Olive stopped talking. Then she said, well, we had a wonderful talk, is what happened. I'm glad, Cindy said. But, Olive, what do you mean, you're a peasant? Well, I mean, I am not all lardada. My father never graduated from high school, though my mother was a teacher. But we were small-time people, and I'm proud of it. Now you better tell me something, Olive said. So Cindy told Olive that her hair should start coming back within a month. It would look like fuzz for a while, but then it would come back, and Olive looked at her with interest, nodding slightly. Then Olive said, say, I've been meaning to ask. What about your sisters, Cindy? What happened to them? Didn't you have a sister? Or two? Cindy was surprised that Olive remembered. She said, yes. One of them lives in Florida. She's a waitress. And my little sister died many years ago Cindy hesitated, then said, of a drug overdose. She added, she'd had issues for years. Olive Kitteridge looked at her, and after a moment she gave a small shake of her head. Godfrey, she said. She crossed her ankles, turning her rump slightly on the chair. Well, then I guess they don't come and see you. My sister-in-law comes. Anita. Honestly, Olive. She's the only person other than you who has come to see me consistently. Anita Coombs, Olive said. Sure, I know who she is. Works in the town clerk's office. That's right. Nice person. She always seemed that to me. Oh, she's wonderful, said Cindy. Boy, she has some problems. But who doesn't? And then Cindy sat up straighter, and she said, Olive, did you tell me about that fight you had with Jack Kennison because you think I'm going to die? Olive looked at her with what seemed to be genuine surprise. After a moment she said, crossing her ankles the other way, no, I told you because I'm an old woman who likes to talk about herself, and there was really no one else I felt comfortable telling. Okay, said Cindy. I thought maybe you figured I was a safe person to tell because you thought I'm going to die, so why not tell her? Olive said, I don't know if you're going to die. They were silent, and then Olive said, I saw you had your Christmas wreath still up. Some people do that, I never knew why. Cindy said, oh, I hate that. I've told Tom so many times. Why can't he remember to take it down? Olive flapped a hand through the air. He's upset, Cindy. He can't concentrate on anything these days. And it was strange, but Cindy saw then that Olive was right. Such a simple statement, but it was completely true. Oh, poor Tom, Cindy thought, Tom, I haven't been fair to you. But Olive had turned to gaze out the window. Would you look at that, Olive said. Cindy turned to look. The sunlight was magnificent, it shone a glorious yellow from the pale blue sky, and through the bare branches of the trees, with the open-throated look that came toward the end of the day's light. But here is what happened next. Here is the thing that Cindy, for the rest of her life, would never forget, Olive Kitteridge said, my God, but I have always loved the light in February. Olive shook her head slowly. My God, she repeated, with awe in her voice. Just look at that February light. 